This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Yeah, and he's got this dagger and he's got forensic gloves on, very carefully handling it. has got the forensic tube, put it in it. They sent it off for DNA analysis urgently and it came back as we can with some DNA. That was the murder weapon that convicted Tobin of the murder and linked Tobin to the murder of Vicky Hamilton. That was a great find for us because that, that officially linked him. My team recovered him over the other side, but he was five years old. The long, youngest I've dealt with, I think, is about 10. So, yeah, not, not good. It's not good. Buried her in Scotland, and then he dug her up again, without a doubt. And that's where she was in that hole. And then he moved to dress because he didn't want anyone to find her. And then he reburied her in, in, in Margate. And it's like Nicola Payne, I search for them. And, it's, 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 and, and that's one of the things I do want to talk about because yeah, the, the Nicola Bully search, we all know about Nicola Bully. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of the search because there is, it'd be unprofessional me because there's an up, upcoming inquest, which is due on the 26th of June. How hard is it though when it's a high profile search and rescue and it's all over the new KUs, some yeah, worldwide, yeah. like the pressure's on you to find a body, like do you feel that added pressure or is it just another yeah. job? No, I do feel the pressure. When you think about that, you just think this poor kid, what she went through and, and Bridger, you know, that's where I'm very pro death penalty, you know, if it, if they, if you kill a child, you know, or if you, you, you kill a child, you need to be disposed of. And boom, we're on. Today's guest with Peter Falden. Peter. Hello, James. Good really to see good. you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting story. Like yeah. most I have on, you've got an amazing book out, What Lies Beneath. Yeah. I downloaded the audio book. Um, forensic search and rescue expert. You've you've rescued hundreds of bodies from water, yeah. many places, missing bodies, murdered. Um, yeah. Some dark, dark stuff. Like, fair play for still having a twinkle in your eye, mate, right. with all the, the madness yeah. you've yeah. seen. Also, I want to promote this straight away because it's important, especially a man who sees a lot of drownings yeah a lot of deaths you says people on paddle boards drowning and yes. um, yeah. not just jet skis and boats and whatever but what is this here that you've got obviously it's a life jacket but what's the meaning behind that what it is james this the little lad on there's a guy a little lad called lucas dobson he was uh -huh. six year old he drowned in the river star in kent we got called into a major search operation to look for him um it was horrendous search it was a fast tidal river basically he was out fishing with his dad they they stepped across onto the boat and Lucas fell between the boats and he got washed away. Everyone dived in after him. And and that one really hit home hard to me. And I've always thought about water safety. We average about 10 drownings a year. In 2016, we had uh, 16 drownings in, in eight weeks. And that was like just a, it, it was horrendous. It was a conveyor belt of death. And we would just go and search, find them, recover them home for their family. And it was really sad. And I thought, well, you know what? I can do something about this. I can try. So what I did, I, I went to Baltic Life Jackets. I got together with a dad, Nathan Dobson. I said, do you mind if I use Lucas's little picture on there? Because it was really upsetting. And um, anyway, we, we got it on. And um, 
I went to Baltic and they agreed to give them to us at cost. So what I do now, I, I fly, you probably know, I fly my own helicopter, I have my own helicopter at home and I fly around the country and I drop them off at schools. So it's a big, big event. You get all the kids come out onto the playing field. They come out, they walk around the helicopter. Then I give them a half hour safety talk, water safety talk. And it's aimed at primary school kids, which is really cool. And um, I do the water safety talk for them. And then I give them eight life jackets of different sizes. And the idea is it's like a library book scheme. So if they're going to go and play near water at the weekend, they can book them out like library, library books. It's fantastic. And everybody loves it. I mean, I'm one man doing this and I'm, I pay for it. I pay for the fuel from a helicopter. I had um, a good friend of mine, um, Debbie Davis, who's one of the real housewives of Cheshire. Um, she lives up near Manchester, and um, she helped me get quite a few schools up there. So Debbie and her husband, Pete, come out with me sometimes. She won't go in a helicopter. She won't fly, but she drives there in a car, and, and it, we attract a bit of the sort of um, local press as well to try and drum it up, this water safety. It's so, so important for, for children. Why is it so important for a life vest that obviously I've got a lot of lot of and yeah. stuff, I do a lot of cold water therapy, we just kind yeah. of walk in. Yeah. Is that dangerous also just walking in, even if it's chest height? It, 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 what it is, mostly the average age of the drowning victims, my team and I recover every, mainly summertime, are between 15 and 17. And what it is, they're always showing off in front of girls, like we all did. And they'll run and jump in the water. They'll swim out as fast as they can to the, as far as they maybe 100 meters, 50 meters. And all of a sudden, the, the water, the cold water sh shock saps your muscles and they get exhausted. I mean, a lot of these people aren't necessarily fit. They'll just swim out. They're not used to the cold. Some get tangled in weed, but not many. Everybody accuses them being drunk. None of them have alcohol. So it's not alcohol that kills them, although that's not good to swim. But it's the cold water shock that saps their energy away. So that's what it is. It's not like underwater currents that zap them away. Yeah. It's just that there is currents. tired. Yeah, there is currents, James. There's, there's mud. You can get your feet stuck in. There's weed. We had one lad who was, and this was really sad. There was a, we got called out by Surrey police to look for this man and his little dog was crying on the riverbank and I've got dogs and I get upset when I see animals injured you know and he was literally howling beside the river and that was where he was marking his owners where he went in and w one of my divers went in uh, we we didn't need to use sonar we put the put the uh, diver in as uh, sonar's not effective in weed and he swam amongst the weed and, and recovered him it really sad he just went to have a wash in the river because he was a bit of a new age traveler chap and he lived in a little um, camper van and he just having to bathe in the fresh water at night and it was very clear in that area very clean water and unfortunately got tangled in weed yeah sad that before we get into everything because i know you've got some high profile searches like april jones yeah um some massive mm. names but i always like to go back to the start of my guests get a wee bit of understanding about you yeah. peter where yeah. you grew up how it all began well, I, 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 I grew up in a place called Woodhatch in Rygate. Um, Dad was a, um, worked for the local, was a printer. Mum was a, did a bit of housekeeping. And we, I started my life in a two-bedroom council house, council flat up on the um, estate in Red Hill, Bats Hill. And I used to, I, I was always a climber from the age of four and a half. I was running across the top of the garage roofs and leaping into the trees. And the, you know, the local ladies weren't impressed, or screaming out the windows of the flats. I mean, we were good kids. We weren't, you know, weren't up to any mischief. We were just playing like kids do. And I do remember one one guy, he, he was slightly, um, what can we say, sort of mentally backward. And he was dressed as, dressed as Batman. And he went running across the roofs of these um, cars one day and he went straight through the sunroof of uh, of one of the, I think it was a, uh, uh, what did he, I can't remember the name of the car now, but it, they had canvas sunroofs in them days, straight through the roof. So we, we lived there for a while um, and then I we moved to a place called Woodhatch. Mum and Dad bought an ex two bedroom council house. It was a real doer upper. So we moved there. And um, I went to the local school, Springvale School, and then I went to the secondary school. But um, I wasn't particularly academic at school. I wasn't. In I was interested in sport. You know, I wanted to run. I wanted to play football. I like physics. I like metalwork. I like history. But I didn't like maths or anything else. So um, that was that wasn't my my fun. I, I school was fine, but I liked the sport stuff. 
Um, and then I went on to, um, when I was five, it's going back a couple of years, was um, my dad was a keen caver. So he was in the army. He used to go caving around the country up to Yorkshire and everything. And he always had these lamps on the stairs with an old caving helmet. And he, a local man called Dennis Musco, Musto discovered a load of old mine workings at uh, Merston in Surrey. And my dad was worked for the newspaper as a stereotyper. So he'd done his apprenticeship as a stereotyper. And he said, Johnny, you, you love caves. Um, come up and, and, and let me, let's do this story. So he went up there and dad took his caving lamp up there, his old calcium carbide. Now, these are really interesting. Those who look them up on the YouTube, they're really good. Calcium carbide, so they're no electric. You put calcium carbide stones in the bottom of the chamber. You screw it on, you put water in the top, and the water drips onto the carbide, produces a settling gas, and the, the, the pressure comes up through a jet, and you strike it with like a flint wheel at the front, and it makes a long white flame, like welders use, but it goes on your head. So you have to be a bit careful when you're climbing down the ladder. Anyway, and Dad went along, uh, met Dennis, and then they said, you know, Dad said, can I come and join you on your exploration? And he basically discovered a series of disused mimes what well, go back to the 11th century, Dennis did, and, and a guy called Robin Walls. And my dad then started going every Sunday with them, and they would come against a roof, what they call a boulder choke or roof fall, and tunnel through. Mm -hmm. What was your first ever job? My first job? Yeah. Um, my first job was I got an apprenticeship as an engineer. Is that the plan at the start, engineer? Yeah, I was an engineering, yeah. I, I got a job as an engineer when I left school. So I started with a company called Multico. But it was that my heart was in the, the tunneling, you see. So I went back, go back a bit to the tunnels. I was every, and, and that was the funny story. So a few weeks later, my dad said um, when he was going down the mines, because that that's what's forged my career. Can I bring my nipper along? He said, I used to call me his nipper. How long how old's your nipper? He said, five. And of course, Dennis had gone, five? Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll clamber up the, up the narrow tunnels for us and see what's up there. So from literally, and, and the photos are in the book, five years old, I was go. dad got me a little helmet, carbide lamp, electric lamp I had first, a little battery lamp. And I used to go down the tunnels and I learned to tunnel from literally five years old. What's that feeling of? Being in a closed, like people get claustrophobic. Yeah, like we understand that you clearly don't. Like, mm. was that feeling of freedom for you? Was that a sense of excitement? Like, what was sense that? Sense of excitement, be, especially for a young kid. It was. It was like living in Indiana Jones. You know, it was like being Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and all that. It was fabulous. I lived this life of excitement. You know, every Sunday, and as I got older, it went from Wednesday night as well, and we'd explore these old mines. And then we'd come across what they call boulder chokes, and then we would dig through. We would dig through these holes, and then on the other side, we would find more passages, and then we'd find clay pipes, what people used to smoke on the ground, and old you know, oxen shoes and stuff. It, it was incredible. I wasn't scared of the dark. You know, I, Dad would send me through a little narrow tunnel. They could just break through, and we'd put a candle through, see if there was enough oxygen. And if the candle went out, there was no oxygen in there. But generally there was. It was pretty good. It was well vented through things like rabbit holes on the surface. And uh, I would crawl through and see what was on the other side. And I'd say it's a 200-meter passage, and I'd go down and have a look. On my own, it was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was weird. Yeah, that's a, a, but a fair play to your dad. I think that's what some kids need. It's yeah. a bit of an adventure. It's a yeah. bit of get up and go and, and putting them in to mad, maybe not mad, mad situations, but I feel as if kids are very... They're very fragile now. I don't know if social media plays a part, laptops, iPads, like they're kind of not living. I've been watching a many videos about just people taking their laptops and iPads off on kids and how creative they become after a couple of weeks and they want to get outside. Back in the 80s, when, when I was about, man, it was yeah. always football, it was always something yeah. outside and yeah. just nature coming in, bogging and just having fun. Like, no worries then. I, I can remember they're just not having any worries. I just think it's a changed days. You see a lot of changes in kids as well. I, I do, James, and I think it's really, really important that kids... I live on a farm. I, I live on a 140-acre uh, sort of farm we, we bought a few years ago, and uh, I love the outdoors. My little girl, we've got chickens, ducks, geese, pigs. They're all pets, 
alpacas, llamas, and I've got four emus as well. So they're, they're just great. And she comes home from school. She does her homework. And then she's, especially in the summer, she's out out with her chickens. She, she puts her chickens in the basket on the front of the front of a push bike and drives around with them. It's brilliant. She camps out and, and that's the life. We keep her away from an iPad. She can look at it when she's traveling. She might on a Saturday morning if she has a bit of a lane, but that's it. We try and avoid it. Mm-hmm. it yeah, I think it's important. It's really, really important. And I and I do see, it was interesting last year, I, I've done a couple of medicals every year, like my pilot's medical, my um, diving medical. I go and see my diving doctor and I said, oh, I don't know, Summer, she's good. And she said, you wouldn't believe it, Peter. I, and this is the doctor. She said, I get mums coming in they they bleach their son's hands and they've all got always got they wipe them in you know bleach wipes and stuff to keep germs off said she'd be the healthiest kid living on a farm let her eat mud you know let her roll in the mud pick germs up and because she'll build an immune system up these kids have got new immune systems they're up the mums demand antibiotics unbelievable Mm -hmm. so how do you go from being a welder to then being an expert searching yeah like how does that because i wouldn't say it was night and day different jobs but it is yeah. kind of like did you always have that ingrained in you that you wanted to be yeah something well, I, different? I, I trained as a radar engineer but my heart was in underground stuff you know that's what i always wanted i used to watch thunderbirds and i wanted to be a rescuer and i thought how do how do it's in the book you know how do i be a rescuer you know it's going to be quite odd anyway i started to um I, t- I used to take groups down the mines because I knew these mines like the back of my hand. I'd do it for a bit of a cash on a Friday night. I can't remember, it was probably 20, 20 pounds or something. And I'd get all these office groups turn up, lend them a hat and take all these girls and guys down the through the tunnels. Like a third game. And they used to love it. And it was a little backhand, mm-hmm. a cash thing I did. And then one day I was up there with dad and we bumped into the fire service. And the fire service were up there doing some training. And they didn't know any w- their way around the mines. I mean, there was 18 miles of surveyed disused mines, like a network of passages that had got opened up. And and then, obviously, p- scout groups are going down now. And I offered to take them down. And they said, yeah, that'd be great. So I got to know them. And then one day, they said, look, if we ever get an incident up here, can we give you a pager so you can be our guide? I said, yeah, fine, no problems at all. And um, and then one night I was laying in bed when I lived in Hawley and suddenly beep, beep, the page has gone off. And all of a sudden we're now, um, the adrenaline's going and I'm thinking, I'm on my way to the first rescue, you know. And I uh, turns up and in them days there was, there was like five fire engines, five or six ambulances for a missing scout group. And I was the one everyone was relying on to go down this mine to find these lost kids. Anyway, I did. I went through and we found them. And they'd been down there about 12 hours and no one had reported them missing for a while. They thought they were gone off somewhere else and gone for a picnic or whatever. And literally the, the, the scout leader was in tears crying. The batteries had all run out on their lamps. And he, could, he told me when we got him out, he actually saw monsters coming out the walls. That's what the dark can do to you. It was quite horrendous. And, and I'd done four or five of them. Then I got introduced to the London Fire Brigade. And because uh, I had this knack of tunneling, and I could I could tunnel, which is is not many people can do that now. Confined space tunneling and shoring up, where you put pit props in and and support the roof. So Dad taught me that from an early age. Um, and then I got introduced to the air ambulance teams in London at Hems. Then I started training them to work under collapsed buildings and confined spaces under trains. And then I started to teach the London Fire Brigade Southwark Training School. And then there was the UXART, they called it, the United Kingdom Search and Rescue Team from the fire service to go to earthquakes. So then I started training them. And it my name sort of got got known out there, but I was only doing this as a volunteer. I wasn't getting paid. So I was still doing my job and stuff in the background and taking leave to do that. A lot of my guests would love you, Peter. Remember that tunneling thing in prison, man? They would be trying to escape you, but it's something like Shawshank Redemption. The Great Escape. <laughs> awesome, awesome movie, James. Yeah, so that's, that's like tunneling then. Like, yeah, yeah. Like digging through it. That's and it. Building it so it doesn't collapse. And shoring it up, yeah. That's mad. Yeah. And that was yeah. no... 
kind of experience, no? Is that just with your dad, just kind of? My dad taught me, I mean, because soft ground tunnelling is a real sort of, not many people can do it. The the fire service now, the, the USAR teams do it incredible. I mean, that since it's come along many uh, over the years because they go into more of the earthquakes. When I was teaching them pre-9-11, it was me was teaching them to do shoring. And then 9-11 came along, a massive disaster, and then they had to do, you know, go and learn elsewhere and what the others were doing. See, the tunnelling thing is, is that can you do it with dirt, rocks, snow? Can you do it with different certain things, or is it only a certain sort of... Well, I, I tend to do it through I do it through rock and, and through clay or me, soil. So it's, it varies the type of soil we're digging, mm. digging through. So then I, I sort of built, I had that skill which I could then hand on to other people and then obviously it then led on to the protest stuff could you which, do the same with snow say like an avalanche oh you could do yeah i mean if you if you've got a snow 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 is a, a, apparently quite self-supporting so if you dig through it mm -hmm. and that's why they dig it round because square corners don't hold this hold up so well so if you dig it round it'll it'll like it'll, 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 it'll like an igloo yeah, yeah that's mad so yeah. when did you get seriously involved in the search and rescue like how does it come about from Teaching people, showing them around mines to then yeah. being serious with it. When did, what age were you? I think I was in my, yeah, I would have been in my 20s when I started to sort of, you know, start, people would come to me. And I think it all turned because I, I at 26, I bought my first flat. Um, my first wife, she got pregnant, Mandy, at, my first daughter when I was about 26 years old. And then we, you know, struggling financially like anybody in them days because the interest rates were going up and down. And then I think I got to, when I was about 30, um, 1991, when we got to 1991, we moved to Hawley. We had a house in Hawley. We probably moved there in 98. And then the suddenly interest rates, you won't remember, but the interest rates went for 4% up to 16% over a year. They just went, and my mortgage was four hundred odd pound a month. It went up to over a thousand pound a month, and then we had the Thatcher government. Then and Maggie's downfall was the poll tax. You heard of the poll tax riots when it was really bad, and I was paying a hundred pound for me and a hundred pound for my wife just on to the council. Two hundred pound a month in them days, a lot of money, and I had to give my house back. So we 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 sort of lost our house, and I end up going to get a job at the airport cleaning just to try and I, I knew I could achieve this business I knew I could do it and I was building my contacts up you know a bit like your business and what you've come through and I think it was and your story is amazing and I think I, I then started to be taken seriously I was on call I was doing stuff I was being called out on the air ambulance I mean one of the craziest things one day I got called by the air ambulance team to a suicide jumper in Kingston. Now the London Fire Brigade at the time had spent a fortune on line rescue equipment. In other words, all the abseil ropes and everything. And then they suddenly got rid of it. So they had no rope rescue team. And I got called to this crane in, in Kingston. I say it's all a bit in, it was all in the book. And I looked up and the firemen are standing there, they couldn't do anything. And uh, the air ambulance court team called me in. And I looked up and I said, yeah, I'll go and try and get her down. So I, I, I got my gear on, I climbed the ladder and she's, the, the guy's locked in his cab because in a crane, you've got a, a, like a, a trap door in the bottom and he's still in there. She locked him in. He's left his padlock loose. He, he's now locked in the crane and he left his tools up there and she's throwing spanners at me. And I'm climbing up this 150 foot crane, ding, ding. And they're rattling beside me. I climbs up and I said, look, I'm not pleased. I've come to help you. And she, we spoke about life and eventually got her down. And, um, yeah, it, that was a weird one. And then I got called to another one with a dumper truck at Heathrow where it fell down a hundred foot sharp. And I, I started to get really recognized at this stage, um, in, in my rescue capability. Why, why you though, if people are going, so to be a yeah. search and rescue, what's the yeah. steps for the average guy? Did they go to college, university, did they go training? Or is it just? Just can't do it. I mean, it's not that. It's, it's, you can go in the fire service, you know, and join the USAR team. That's where they, they would go now. But uh. I, I led this extraordinary life, James. You know, I was, grew up with wanting to be this rescue and I was driven by events. I was bumped into people and people said, can you come and train our team? Can you do this? And I think one of the biggest turning points for me was I, we lost our house. I moved to a flat 
Um, times were hard. And then I got a call one day, and I, I wanted to call my company Specialist Rescue International. And I got, you can imagine, I got people laughing at me, it's Thunderbirds. So I started this company. Uh, I had no money. And I went to the bank manager and said, I want to borrow £1,500 overdraft. He said, you'll never get anywhere being a rescuer. I said, well, I'm going to try. And because I started then to write articles for a magazine, for international fire magazines. And I'd get about £300 for an article, you know. And I did. And, and then my name got around. And then I started to train the oil refineries. So Elf Oil, Gulf Oil, BP, and in rescue, rescue from height and all this. And my name was out there. <clears throat> but the most interesting one was when I got a call one day, my wife with baby in hand, Mandy, answered the phone and said, Specialist Rescue International. He said, oh, my name's Mervyn Edwards. Can I speak to Peter? And she's held the hand over the microphone, over the phone, because uh, Natasha was crying in the background. <laughs> said, yeah, just hold. I'll get him for you. I'll put you through. <laughs> so we lived in a flat. Hello, Peter. Um, my name's Mervyn Edwards. We got, I don't know if you've been watching the news. I didn't really have time to watch the news in them days. And we got a bit of a problem with protesters in some tunnels at Newbury Bypass. I said, right, I don't know if you've seen it. I said, I haven't. And he said, I'd like to have a chat with you tomorrow. And that was the start. That was the turning point for me financially and uh, to actually start the business, which we can talk about. That's mad, do I not? Like See when, see when they call you, Peter. Yeah, are they basically dead, or is there a good chance they're alive? When are you 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 called the first day, or you called when they can't find them after three, four days? Drowning yeah. victims. So we we cover for police diving. So we cover Essex. We don't really do much up there because generally quiet. Kent Police, Surrey Police, Sussex Police, Thames Valley Police, and Hampshire Police. Now. People think that every police force has got an underwater search team of divers or frogmen, whatever you want to call them. They haven't. There's very few left now. The nearest one to us is that we cover the whole of the southeast. The next one is the Met. The Met are really refined to London and sort of bit of Essex. Occasionally they come out, but they're extremely busy. The next one is Nottingham. And the next one's Avon Somerset. There's very few. Essex, Sussex got rid of theirs, disbanded it through budget cuts. Thames Valley disbanded theirs. So we are the call, team on call to recover the drowning victims, and we deal with a number of suicides every year as well. So when you get called, is it drowning, suicides? <coughs> when you talk about going up the crown, like, how yeah. does, what sort of, when did it start becoming so serious when you started getting... The big calls, because I know you've searched for like Peter Tobin's yeah. missing victims. Like, when does it? When do you become like from cl cl climbing a crane, yeah. helping a suicide, just trying help a life, to then getting called yeah. for fucking some serious dark stuff? I think I think the protest stuff happened first because we ended up digging. You remember Swampy? Yeah. So Swampy, I I was called in to deal with the protesters at Newbury. I didn't. I remember the under sheriff saying to me, he said. Peter, he said, we got these oaks down these tunnels, da di da di da you know. And he said, I need a copy of your contract. And I said, he said, you haven't got a contract, have you? I said, uh, no. He said, cobble something together and I'll get it signed. I need these people out of the tunnels. And then from there, I went to the Honiton Bypass to dig Swampy out. And then we'd done that. And while we were down there, they were digging in at Manchester Airport for a month. You know, that we had, took a month to get them out. And then... All the money that we earned on that, it was high risk work and it was really dangerous work. I mean, I'm I'm down there crawling down these tunnels with my team and I'm being hung upside down by my feet as you see the pictures in the book of me in 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 down a shaft by my ankles trying to release a chain. Now these these protesters, and I'll probably talk about this first before we go on to the, the murder stuff, you know, because the, the protesters, we built this mutual respect up with them. They knew me. And I would turn up and they'd say, where's Pete? And and it, I'll go and get him, you know, I'd come over and then I'd be down the tunnel with him and Swampy's on one side of the door and I'm the other and we're taking the little, and you could imagine these tunnels are this high, they're tiny. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those protesters, the ones who chain themselves to the road and glue themselves? There's a guy in the snooker table yeah. who's throwing no. dry paint and I'm thinking, yeah. they do more damage than good. There's yep. kids at these events. You could have had anything yep. in that bag thrown over the table. Yep. People yep. are genuinely scared that they could have been gas, it could have been fucking poison. Yep. And these people think it's fine. And 
I, now I'm hearing a lot of these people are actually paid by big corporations yeah. to do this kind of madness yeah. that somebody died in an ambulance because they couldn't get yep. a hospital because these fucking idiots are tying themselves yep. to the road like they're, they're pain. I, I get protest and try to yeah, make a change like I totally yeah. understand it but I feel as if who's right then if you're yeah. trying to protest something but causing destruction as well then what? how good are you no different I yeah so the guys down the tunnels I got no problem with you know at the end of the day I made a good living out of that over the years and they were fine they were polite everything the ones who chain themselves to the roads glue themselves to the roads stop the public stop emergency vehicles stop people getting themselves honestly they got to bring some tough sentences in I'm I don't I don't wear it I've got no zero respect for them whatsoever um if you disrupt major disruption everyone's got a right to free protest and speech i've got no problem with that if you want to go and hang out in parliament square with a placard and make your point and i think what it is they just they they're not gaining no respect i mean we got called when they dug in at the oil refinery down in kent they dug a tunnel down there and the police couldn't get them out i was over in europe and they said we might have to bring you back to dig these people out and i didn't in the end because uh, they came out they run out of food but I've got no time. Swampy, um, he, he's he been disrupting HS2 and stuff on private land, on private woods. He's actually, yes, he's causing disruption and, and been a bit of a pain in the backside. But I've got no real big issue with him. He He's actually a nice enough lad. But it's the ones who, like you said, lay in a public road and block the police and emergency services from getting. And It's when your mum's been burgled, there's someone having a heart attack and the ambulance can't get there we've got to toughen up on them ones yeah that's that's it's it's you know i i i i, I said i'm open to f you know freedom of speech and pro you know peaceful mm -hmm. protest but once it gets violent and the other one is once they start throwing paint over buildings and lovely paintings in a gallery what are you achieving you, you know what you're doing you're effectively and they say they want dialogue with the with the government and people, but no one's going to talk to them when they're doing this type of yeah, stuff. Schoolboy stuff. Some of them it, are kind of deluded, kind of mental health. People just yeah. want to feel part of something where yeah. they'll do daft shit to find. A lot of people do it for views now. A lot of people do it for views, TikTok, Twitter. Yes, doing stupid right. shit. Yep. Think they're, they're trying to change the world. Yep. That listen, the world's going to keep going whether you throw paint or not. I agree. Do you know what I mean? Like, what was the first dead body you'd seen, Pia? First one I saw, I saw a few on the air ambulance when I was, the first, I, I saw a lot on the air ambulance, I would say, because we would, when I used to train them in confined spaces and I used to take the Merstams, the, the doctors and the paramedics, they then would take me out on the air ambulance once every six weeks as an as a, a observer. And they actually put me on the advanced trauma life support course as an observer. So I learned a lot of sort of medical skills where I could just understand what the doctors were doing. And um, I would go out to stabbings, I would go out to road accidents, and I would see, you know, death then. Um, and I think one of the most shocking ones I saw, we, I was out in the amp medical car one Christmas Eve with a doctor, helping the doctor carry his kit and everything else, because I, I found the medical stuff fascinating, you know. I wasn't a paramedic, I, was, I, was, I could do so much, but I wasn't like a paramedic or anything. And I'd help the doctor, and we got called to a hanging. And we walked in this front door and the police were there and there's a Chinese guy hanging from his tie from the banister uh, just staring at us. And and that was quite quite shocking. And I just thought, Christmas Eve, this poor man, his family. And I always think about the family, you see. It's not just he's left, he's decided to take his own life. But what about the family he's leaving behind? And that always hurts me, you know, when I see when I pull drowning victims out with my team and I say, it's not just me. I often find them with a sonar. The boy, I'm a diver as well, but the boys are going to recover the body or I recover the body and we take them out of the water and they're just laying there staring at you. And you just think two hours ago or where, you know, cause we always get called pretty quickly and we find them really quickly and they're just laying there and they were walking around a couple of hours ago. Now they've got the loved ones at home and the loved ones may not even know they're dead yet. And I think one of the hardest hitting ones, we, we do a lot of suicides every year. And I, we had a one in Surrey near Newdigate and there was a lady just, she done all her makeup and she had some pills and she had a bit of some whiskey and she just wandered into the lake. She's done all her hair and we recovered her body and the police were down by the lake and we were up by a command center and this gentleman turned up 
And he said, oh, excuse me, he said, have they found it? I said, do you mind if I ask who you are? Very politely. And he said, um, I'm a husband. And I and I sort of put my hand, arm around him and led him off. I said, so, really sorry, sir, but um, yes, we have found that because there were no police officers to give that message. Ten minutes later, another gentleman turned up. He said, oh, do you know if they've, they've found her yet uh, by a name? I said, do you mind if I ask who you are? He said, I'm her ex-husband. And I got the kids in the car. And it was like, whoa, and that brings a tear to your eye. Things like that is not, I don't, <clears throat> I don't enjoy dealing with drownings, and that's why I started the life jacket campaign. I hate it. I hate. I don't want to be called out. We don't want to be called out to drownings, but we know once we get to the end of May, we carry our bleepers. You know, at night I'll be out on the farm and I'll be out on the tractor or playing with the kid in my, my, my summer, and the bee, 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 and it says person in water. I know that person in water is not alive because while we get called by the fire service or the police, they're dead. And we've got to go and find them. How is that then? If you're playing the farm with your daughters and you get that beep, 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 knowing you're going to find a kid, a dead body, yeah. Or a, yeah. not just a kid or an adult, but how's yeah. that feeling? That like, Do you become just so numb to it, job on, kind of leave it at home, I'm leaving my kids, or does it still in play in your mind that could be my kid? Or like, how, how do you switch off from going and picking up dead bodies every other day? I, I think I've, I've got a good family and I... And where I live, I live rural on a farm, and I enjoy my animals and everything else. So I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a great wife as well. And um, we I get home and sit down. Depends what time. Sometimes we get back at three in the morning. We won't be out in the dark, but I'll get home and I'll just sit and have a glass of whiskey or a glass of red wine, and we will just relax and we will just talk about it. And then I go to bed and just try and forget about it if I can. It who's, would crack you up. Who's the youngest person you've ever found? Lucas Dobson, my team, uh, yeah. I I actually didn't see Lucas. He was he was the, my team recovered him over the other side, but he was five years old. The long, youngest I've dealt with, I think, is about ten. So yeah, not not good. It's not good. Did you ever get? Do you get therapy or anything? Do you get to speak to anybody? Or do you just unwind with the messes and the kids and all the animals? Is that your kind of downtime? We can. We we've got access to counsellors if we need it through the emergency services, but. I, I deal with it myself. I just deal with it myself. And I've dealt with so many now. It's a bit like a, you know, if you think about paramedics every day and doctors and dealing with death all day long, they're dealing with it all day long, which is really tough. I'm not. I'm dealing with it occasionally, more more so in the summer. And the summertime is like a convey about a death for us. It's not nice. And that's why on my social media feeds, on my Twitter, on my Facebook, and a company Facebook, I put water, you see them, there's water safety messages out there all the time, just trying to tell people, just be careful, not not being a killjoy, not don't go near the water, but if you're on the beach, swim between the flags where the lifeguards, who are brilliant, keep an eye on you. If you go on a paddleboard, put a life jacket on. You're not a pansy if you go out wearing a life jacket, because I can tell you now, if you fall off, or the, the, you know, people don't realise the weather. You could be on Loch Lomond. And it's calm. Give you an idea. I was out last year in Lake Garda, I, and we, I was I, I watching a boat go out, and I knew the weather was going to change. The wind was due to pick up, and all these little pleasure boats out on Lake Garda were in one minute in the sunshine, and then I could feel the breeze picking up, and all of a sudden, the whole of Lake Garda turned into a washing machine. It was like really rough, and people were screaming to get back in in their pleasure boats. None of them had life jackets on, so. A lake can turn very nasty very, very quickly with a bit of wind or a storm. See when you get into the water, do you know, see when you find the body, do you know how long they've actually been dead for? Yeah, generally, yeah. I mean, if we're dealing with suicide, some, we've, I mean, we've had them in their water for three months where we've been called and we've been looking. But um, generally, if, if a body goes in and it's a witness drowning, we got intelligence that there's a body in that stretch of water. We always find it, always find it. If it's after two or three months and there's been the, – the, the difference is finding bodies is if it's a storm water, there's been massive rainfall, and somewhere like the River Severn where it's gushing through, then it's – then they're likely to get washed a long way down. But in canals, rivers, lakes, if they go in, we find them. I always thought bodies came to the surface. Uh, interesting. Right? They do. After and there's no exact science on this. After about six to five or five to eight days, a body 
the where your body decomposes from inside out, it, it f makes a gas. Don't know what gas it is. <clears throat> the body bloats like a dead seal, and the body will just come up to the surface and lay on the surface. And that's why most dog walkers find bodies. They will find a body what's gone missing because, again, with the lack of underwater search units in the UK now, forces who don't have underwater surface search units, their loved one could be laying in the river and won't never be found until, unfortunately, you have a grim find of a decomposed body. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? It is mad. It's mad. How many of these search, search and rescue teams are in the UK? Is that many? I think there's about seven underwater search units now across the whole of the UK. Because we've so got a, a Scotland, lot, you got one, please. A lot Scotland of goes up and down the Clyde side. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. Erskine Bridge, a few people used to jump off of. Yep. Like, if you get main targets, like certain areas where you know, okay, that's a suicide, a certain bridge or a certain river. Yeah. In here. Yeah. How many suicides do you would you see roughly a year? You deal with about five, five to six. And COVID. And again, we, we expected it to go up in COVID, but we actually didn't. I think we had about three on average during COVID. Um, but a lot of the time, they they do different ways of committing suicide. And I'm not going to go into that, but we had one gentleman who literally put a rack sack full of bricks on his back and he tied a, a message in a bottle and he put it like a string around it. It was empty bottle. He jumped in the river and that floated on the water on the top and that indicated where he was. That showed us where he was, and he just wanted to be recovered. Sad, that isn't it's it? really, really sad, and it's it's tough to deal with, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't enjoy any of I I enjoy crime search when I'm looking for a weapon, when I'm looking for something which is going to potentially get a conviction, but I don't enjoy looking for drowning victims. I never have done. I none none of my team do. We don't you know we don't think oh whoopee it's a call out. We'd rather be sitting. At, I'd rather be home with the family. To be honest, we're busy enough as it is without dealing with that stuff. You know. See, if you find somebody under the water, can you tell if they're suicide or they've been pushed? Because what's the difference if somebody yeah. says, "I ah, just jumped"? But what if it's been pushed? Is there a certain way? It's normally a death grip. What they call a death grip. So, people when they drown, normally they like one guy. In, um, they grab their glasses or they grab onto weed. So normally they've got they grip the weed and they have it in their hands like that is normally if they're in the water and their arm hands are open they're probably dead before they hit the water it's a bit of a strange one but if people drown they they generally what, what they call the death grip see when you're getting called out to yeah is it not just so it's not just bodies you're also looking for murder weapons you're yeah. looking for many things yeah yeah we're looking for um, years ago, we used to do a lot of drugs as well, a lot of under ships and all that sort of things um, for customs and excise. So we, it's drugs, um, terrorist devices, all all sorts of different work. Really, we've been involved with over the years. Um, but yeah, weapons, shotguns, um, just simple evidence. It doesn't need to be, you know, anything. It can be any part of evidence for a police force that they require. Mm -hmm. Tell me this, Peter. I read this years ago, but I don't know if it's true. Dolphins. Yep. They can sense like bombs and oh, yeah. bodies and like how how intelligent is a dolphin? Well, I don't know, but I've read something what the U.S. Navy are doing, and they the, and they train dolphins to deliver explosives to ships and all sorts. They're yeah. very clever. Dolphins are. I mean, it's like animals. I mean, we've got chickens, you know, and you don't realise how intelligent these little creatures are. They've they they've got feelings like anything. I mean, I saw a duck one day, really horrible, and I love animals, and I saw a duck get run over in the road on this quiet country lane the car just drove off and his little friend is the female was just running around crying around him in the road and that was really sad and i just things like that affect me you know you look at that and just think the poor little thing is it's, it's got feelings and you don't realize that your pig has got my pig i've got one called louis the pig and he's a rescue pig and i've got two others and they go out with him and he, and i think churchill said a pig will look you and lie like a human or something but they they are so clever and he he can he he gives you his paw and he'll do a twirl he's a really clever pig and yeah, yeah you know pigs are highly intelligent they are same as that listen i've went vegan i've went veggie but yeah. I, I, gen, I i do love chicken i love steak yeah me too but if you actually do look at the animal if you feel its breath if you can feel yeah. its heartbeat and look yeah. at its eyes you can see that 
they're here for a purpose whether it's to eat them or not I, I genuinely I wish I, I wouldn't but yeah, I've been so conditioned I, to brought out and eating fucking meat since same, same as you Jack I know I eat meat we don't kill any of our animals because yeah. they are literally but it's a mass contradiction yeah. isn't it yeah, we love it, animals it I don't, I look never, at it got feelings that little no, duck but then we'll go and have fucking duck soup or whatever it is I and I like a, I like a steak like you do I like lobster <laughs> lobster and fish and everything, yeah. everything really but as long as we don't see them getting killed no, then it, it's not exactly, as bad exactly I, I haven't gone vegan now I, I just that's what my, my daughter went vegan for years but my oldest daughter but she then went away with her buddies one day and started eating burgers again so yeah. see when you're going for a search and rescue for somebody that's in the water what yeah. sort of equipment would you need to get? well we got um in in 1999 i went out to because one of the big things i sat on a home office working group over here for the government and one area was looking at was underwater search we only had divers and we could not search large areas of water, but the Americans seemed to have it nailed. So I went out to the States and I looked at a team we were using this side scan sonar and um, we brought it back to the UK. And it's it basically is like a missile you turn behind the boat. And this was what I used on the, the Nicola Bully case, uh, what was a lot of controversy around. Um, it sends a sound wave across the riverbed. And I can scan 20 meters or up to 30 meters either side of the boat, like we call it a swathe. So if you imagine the missile getting towed behind the boat, the, the, the tube, and it sends a signal out and it hits a target and a body looks like a body. There's a picture in the book. Can I show you? There's like a, yeah. is a yeah, picture in the, in the book that actually is a body laying on the bottom. Yeah, just show up to the camera. There you go. Well, that is a body on the left. That yeah. the, that's the body there. There it is. It's just like Yeah, that's it. How, and I can zoom how in deep on was that. that. Oh, that was in thirty feet of water. So you know. So yeah, yeah it's that's yeah. you know, if if there's a body in the water, mm -hmm. I'll find it. It's as simple as that. The we, we train constantly and I, I I developed sonar in the UK over here. I, I was the first person ever to use it forensically. And that's the kit we use. It's got better. We got higher. We had 900 kilohertz. Then we went to, this is frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the detail. Then we went to 1200 and we've spent 55 grand a couple of years ago on a new one. And that's now 1800 kilohertz. I can find little bags on the bottom. It's, it's footprints. I put a picture on my social feed the other day on Twitter and I showed footprints actually on the bottom. Yeah, that's mad, because I know helicopters use is it infrared they use. They use, the helicopters use thermal image. We, the, the problem is when you see the police going overhead with thermal image cameras and searching for people, once someone drowns, they generally go to the bottom. They, mm -hmm. they, do, they don't stay. Unless you've got a life jacket on, they will go straight to the bottom and they will stay there. They won't move. We can get called in. We've been called into jobs, particular one in Oxfordshire, three days after the event. We got called in. And they were searching up and down the river. They couldn't find him. They had a, uh, the environment agency had a sonar. It wasn't like ours. No one could find him. I put the sonar in, found him straight away. Diver went in and recovered the lad. A guy called Ellis Downs, a chap called Ellis Downs, really sad. And he was laying on the bottom for three, three days. He hadn't moved. Bodies don't move in still-ish water. If it's a raging flood they might tumble down the water down the river a bit more get lodged but if it's pretty calm bodies always go to the bottom what's the deepest you can go 50 meters we can go 50 meters on air and that's that's because we're governed we're professional divers and we're governed by the health and safety executive where sport divers can use trimix and things like that so they can go really deep but we're governed to 50 meters so what if somebody's 60 70 meters Oh, there's an, that was that was a, a good point actually. So there was one down in the quarry, the National Dive Centre in Chepstow, and there was a couple, young couple. They went diving. He was a quite experienced diver. She wasn't. He decided, we don't know why, to try and take her in down to 50 meters one day. So we got the call. What happened? They went diving. Didn't tell anybody. They sneaked in, and they they while the guy was at lunch, they dumped their cars, got their dive kit, and went diving. Anyway, they never come up. Um, guy in the um, dive centre reported the car to the police. They PNC'd it, done the number plate check, went to the family. Oh, they've gone diving in the quarry. No sign of them. Even Somerset Police, South Wales Police searched. 
And then on the Sunday, we got the call to say, too deep for us, Pete. We need your kit down here. So I tried using sonar, but the rocks on the bottom of this quarry are so big boulders, it won't go between the boulders. So we got a thing called a remote-operated vehicle, an ROV. So we sent the submarine down, and we, rec we, we located them using the submarine. But it was out of the range of the police dive team, Bob Randall and his team from over Somerset. So we thought, how are we going to do this? And this sport diver walked over from the dive center. And he said, I'm a trimix diver because we'd found the body. And I've, that's the worst thing we've got. Um, it wasn't me. It was Darren who actually found them. And I, was, I, I had been searching all day long. And then I had a break. I just needed a cup of tea. My eyes were going on the screen. And he said, I found them. I walked over. And there was these just two lifeless bodies laying on the bottom. It's really grim in 70 meters of water. So this diver come over and he said, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, but I can offer my help. And uh, anyway, he swam down to 70 meters, hooked a line on them. That was his job done. And then what we done, we put two boats out and we pulled them up from 70 meters to 50 meters. And then I remember driving the boat with Bob hanging on the end with the two bodies over to a 19 meter shelf i think it was 19 or 17 meters landed them on the shelf we changed divers then another police day was a police diver because they were the divers on that operation we located them using our kit and then we pulled them up again and it was just horrible and uh, you know just girlfriend boyfriend i think the toughest part of that job was we recovered the bodies we got them got we we done what we needed to do with the police and the dive center put on some food for us and there's all these grown men, all these great police divers, and us all sitting around chatting. We all knew each other. And a lady walked over, and she said, excuse me, gentlemen. She said, um, my name's, I'm the mother of uh, the, uh, the, one of the boy or the girl. And she said, I'd just like to thank you for what you've done today with tears running down the street. That's, that's my daughter, you, you know, whatever. And I've never seen men just like with tears running down their face that is tough when you're dealing with that you're dealing with a mother who's just lost a daughter a son and we were speechless nobody actually said a word we were just there all these you know ex-military guys and everything and there were just tears running down our cheeks and no one spoke we just ate our lunch and no one spoke to each other how did both of them die they died, he, they were tied together on what they call a buddy line. So he clipped her to him. He, he, he had been diving in salt water in the sea. The salt is buoyant. That's why the Red Sea, you float easier. Mm. They were now diving in fresh water. So he had too much weight on him. So what he's led weights, he had too many. So he, he couldn't hold himself up. And he just literally dragged her down to 70 meters. And so she would have, he dived of barotrauma. Um, and she still, I think they, he's, he's basically his lungs burst. And, uh, I remember looking at post-mortem pictures, it was horrible, but I think it's, um, yeah, not nice. That's one of them tough jobs you do. I see when you go underwater, like when does, when do you start feeling the pressure? When do you start feeling the lungs and everything kind of? Well, you equalize as when you're underwater, you eat, we equalize. So as we go down, if you don't do you do that we have a no what they call a nose block on our mask so inside our full we wear a full face mask inside the face mask you've got a little v block but you push your nose into it to block your nose and like when on an airplane when you come in on an airplane pop you go ears. pop your ears if you don't do that your eardrums burst so as we go as we descend that's why you always descend slowly and that's when you from a dive whenever you come up most of our diving is less than five meters because it's shallow rivers and canals and stuff like that but it's very black we can't see anything so as you come up whenever you come up from diving you always breathe out you don't hold your breath or the lungs will expand and burst your lungs oh well, zach's i've seen videos as well with a fire service i think it was like two three meters of water the person was there drowning but because of health and safety yeah they couldn't get in and save them like how hard is that is <sighs> like for me personally it's easy for me to say listen yeah, yeah. fuck my job i'm going to save that yeah. person but they didn't because if they did and something went wrong it's them who gets done like how hard is that for someone to see that yeah it's, it's all about um yeah firefighters will always do their best to save somebody you know mm -hmm. the great bunch of guys and and police as well um 
but unfortunately there was an incident down in Southampton where there was a, a, a slightly um, he had mental health issues this Lord, this gentleman and he used to go down and feed the ducks every day in the pond anyway for some reason he fell in the pond and someone called the emergency services the police turned up police officer was going to drop him he got stopped couldn't get in we'll call the water rescue unit and when they finally went running jumping into the pond half hour later it was up to their waist it wasn't a deep pond at all and he died and there was a big inquiry into that so i think we would all do what we can do we're we're a private company whereas the fire service is governed nationally mm -hmm. and and we we've done some really risky stuff in in what we do sometimes you just have to do it yeah what's the biggest what's the longest you've went and sit, got rescued someone for how long have they been underwater underwater <sighs> Blimey. Um, well, drowning victims can be under days if they're left under days. Normally, we have them out within an hour. I mean, there was that's if if they drown, we're on scene quickly. Generally, depends where it is, and we recover them quickly. Uh, but we had a chap who was underwater for three months, and he wasn't in a good way. Three month old body. See when they decompose in that. When does it start going skeleton kind of way? Or is the water just kind of the flesh? He was solid. I mean, we had a, I had a guy called. Um, Damien Touch was in a car, so he w he was missing down in West Mercia. Police called me, and I was brought in to review the case. They were just going to throw the case away and case closed, basically. And they brought me in to review it. And I I said he's in the river because it had been searched twelve times by a voluntary organisation with what they thought was a sonar. It wasn't a sonar; it was a fish finder. And I said, he's in the river. He said, well, he can't be because the environment agents, he said, if he's in the river, there'll be oil residue on the bottom. It, it will show up where it leaks out the fuel tanks and petrol. And I said, well, I believe he's in the river looking at cell site analysis from his mobile. So I said, trust me to come in. I'll find him if he's there. So I, they, they asked me to go down. I put the sonar in the water. In 10 minutes, I found two cars. We dived the first one. It was a stolen car. Second one, it was Damien's car. We found Damien Touch. He had been in the water 18 months, but because he was inside his car, it was a suicide, the windows were sealed up, but no fish life could get to him. So he was a solid block of like wax. So his body was, he was, he was a body. And what happens if the fish caught him? Would they have been eaten? They would eat you. Yeah, marine life just eats you. You know, so it's sea shrimps, whatever. The, the, the crayfish will just... It, demolish you yeah mm, yeah they will mm. what was what's the the first big case you, you worked on that missing case but when did you the peter tobin thing come about the first big one for me because it won't because once i brought i'll try and explain this so once i brought sonar into the uk mm -hmm. i met a guy called mark harrison uh, mark harrison mbe he was the National Police Search Advisor. He was a great guy, and he wanted to see this kit. So he started coming out with us on training exercise with, after I brought it back from America in 1999. And Mark said, I'm going to put you on the Expert Advisors database because we need this kit, and you know your stuff. You're the only person who can use this kit in the UK. And I said, yeah, fine, Mark. And obviously, there was a charge for that. So I got put on the database. And it was in them days, it was the National Crime Faculty, and then it became the National Crime and Operations Faculty, now the National Crime Agency. And um, Mark, the Nishi, called me in to search for Alison McGarrigill in the Clyde in Scotland. And I confirmed that the wheelie bin she had been dismembered in was not in the Clyde. It wasn't there. Eventually it was found by fishermen, on, and it was hauled up in fishing nets on land. Um, but... That was a big case, and then Mark started be calling me in all around the UK. But at the same time, I was looking at a thing called ground penetrating radar to look for buried bodies. When I was a kid, I forgot to mention that my dad taught me to find stuff. So he would tell me, he'd walk along, my dad would be picking coins up. He said, Keep your eyes open, son, you'll miss it. And we'd go to the woods and look for depressions where mines had, you know, old, old mines had been filled in. And I, I could find stuff, and I had this natural ability to find things. And that's where it sort of came on all these years later, really. And I, I, I will find anything, you know. And uh, we use a range of metal detectors. We use all sorts of technology. But ground radar. So I developed this, not developed, I got this ground radar. 
and knew him Mark. Mark rang me one day, he said, I've got a very confident, confidential case for you to work on. It's a guy called Tobin. I'm going to send you the file encrypted. It's uh, it, it's an active, we're in a hurry on this one. It, within two weeks, we're going to search this house. A Tobin's been arrested, so he attempted to murder two children down his South Sea. As you know, Tobin was vile. And then he murdered Angelica Kluke in the Glasgow. Scottish church, that's yeah. it. And, and he lived in Bathgate. Now, when he got convicted of that, they then started looking at his background because they used to be a rapist going around Scotland called Bible John around Glasgow. But they could never sort of pin it on him. So then they looked at Bathgate where Tobin lived and they realised that Vicky Hamilton, who went missing 15 years earlier, lived just around the corner from Tobin. So Mark, Mark rang me up and said, you are going to conduct the full, police aren't going to do it, you are with your team. The police will provide forensics for you, but you are the one going to be searching this house. We're looking for a murder weapon and we're looking for a body. So I went up there and there was this big rockery in the back garden. Again, it's in the book, the pictures, and uh, there's a rockery in the back garden. And the neighbour, I, I, I always go and talk to the neighbours or talk to the with police permission because you get more information from the neighbor or who's like the local area the kids tell me if there's any mine shafts or wells in the woods they'll always tell you where they are we don't know the area and um he said yeah he said one day pete as i called him you know pete tobin yeah good old pete he was a guy's a serial killer didn't realize at the top of the garden he dug this huge hole and it went over two meters deep and he said what are you digging for australia pete and he said, yeah, I'm digging a sand pit for my, my little one. Anyway, a couple of days later, it all got filled in. He said, where's the hole? Where's the sand pit? Social services told me to fill it in. Never thought nothing more of it. And over the years, the rockery got bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's eventually a big mound. And that was it. So the first bit we focused on was the mound. And then I got the forensic archaeologist who will dig anything up. She um, took all the um, the um, rockery away we then got the human remains dogs the police they then probed the ground because police dogs you probe the ground first you leave it for 30 seconds 30 minutes sorry then send the little dog in and the dog if he finds something they they're trained they put their nose to the ground wag their tail and then they get their ball some dogs will just stand still but they vary i've worked with mandy chapman a good friend of mine in london and she's a brilliant dog handler and that they train uh, dog carly they train in different ways anyway he indicated then they sent that dog out they don't normally do this but they decide to leave it another half hour probe again and bring another dog in dog indicated so then i'll run the radar over and um, I, I saw this huge hole going down about two meters with what they call a hyperbola and it looked like something. It could have been, a, bear in mind, it could be looking for a dismembered body or a full body. And it was, um, it was nothing. It was basically the archeologists followed the hole all the way down that Tobin originally dug, but there was nothing there. I then searched the kitchen, the guards team got a call from Aiden in the loft said, Pete, I found something. He said, I found a knife straight up in the loft and and what we do when we search we strip all the lagging out everything comes out the loft you search the gutters you search everything using boroscopes anyway there's this dagger and he's got this dagger and he's got forensic gloves on very carefully handling it's got the forensic tube put it in it they sent it off for dna analysis urgently and it came back as vicky Anderson's dna that was the murder weapon that convicted Tobin of the murder and linked Tobin to the murder of Vicky Hamilton. That was a great find for us because that that officially linked him. Tobin was a evil, he was, evil he was a bastard, bastard he man. Was, yeah. that he was. He draped a young Polish girl. The priest was a dirty uh, fucking sex yeah. case. Father yep. Jerry. Yep. That, yep. He used to come into my school as well. Where I'm from, that near the apostle, oh, well. that and St. St. Pat's. I used to go to school with side that. <laughs> fucking seedy seedy bastards like Tobin though I seen the video coming out of court and they kicked the photographer and you could see the evilness even when he was dying in his deathbed he wouldn't oh, he was because they're saying he's done potentially 10, 20 other murders yeah, oh, yeah. I think Tobin um, you know David Swindle he was the chief superintendent on the job and he ran a big operation and 
David talks about it a lot, and uh, it's just Tobin even attacked the media that day when he came out. I remember mm. he just I mean, filmed, he went for the cameraman yeah. and everything. He was just vile, and he, he is responsible without doubt, without doubt. And Mark Williams Thomas often speaks about this. He's looked at this case, and he's without doubt murdered many more, without a doubt. Yeah, he's not just Fred and Rose West. This is, a, I, I know I never worked on that job, but this is just a huge. He's a huge one. How was that feeling for Vicky's family? Were they still alive? Like fifteen years <coughs> later, to then was it fifteen years later? Yeah, it was fifteen years later. I never see. I never met the family. That was nineteen ninety seven. I ne- two thousand seven. Sorry, two thousand seven. I never met the family. Um, I met the. There's been documentaries. Me talking on recently with the police. They've done a lot of documentaries on it, but. We then went straight down to Portsmouth from there, his old house in Southsea, which he rented a room. So I had to do a full forensic search of that house. I, we cut the floorboards, went under his bedroom where he lived because he we knew he was a barrier, but there was no sign of Vicky. Now, while we were working in Southsea, and that there's a picture of me leaving the Southsea address and my forensic suit on in the book, and... Lucy Cyburn, who's the forensic archaeologist who excavated um, Sarah Payne, brilliant forensic archaeologist, uh, and they were working in Kent with Kent Police, along with being guided by the um, of the Strathclyde as well. And they went down there. They dug in the garden. Lucy did, and they found the bodies of two victims. That was Vicky Hamilton and Dinah Mc- Nicole. Now. Dinah went missing from Rygate Hill. She hitched a lift and she got in with the wrong guy one day. And Vicky Hamilton, they were both dismembered. They were both cut cut in half. Um, I've seen the pictures and they still have their nail varnish on. It's horrendous. And um, Lucy, Lucy done the excavation, but it was just, he, he'd murdered Vicky and he'd buried her in Scotland and then he dug her up again without a doubt. And that's where she was in that hole. And then he moved a dress because he didn't want anyone to find her. And then he reburied her in, in in Margate. So do you see the, the first hole you dug? Do you feel Peter Tobin buried Vicky yeah, there? Yeah, without a doubt. Dug yep. her back up? Yep, yep. And travelled up to Scotland and buried her there? No, to, no he travelled to Margate in Kent from Scotland because he was moving house. Uh-huh. He then sold his house there. He was then bought a new house in Margate. So... He then brought Vicky with him, so undoubtedly that he built, buried Vicky first and then Dynamic Nicole. Do you think that's some sort of fetish, having them dead bodies around you, buried in Probably. your garden? I think he just didn't want he didn't want to be exposed because people do their gardens and they weren't that deep underground, but they're encased in concrete. So you know, and this is what you know. You hear the, the police getting knocked for all sorts of stuff. That was a that was an incredible investigation they did. It really was. And and a lot of them, you know, go on around the UK. You know, police are always getting beaten up for not doing good jobs. But I've worked on with some great detectives around the UK, and some of the best and awesome people. Yeah, I've been saying this recently. Like, yeah. But I grew up was a rough environment. It was yeah. always stay back from the corpus. Oh, like, yeah. hate the bastards, this and that. But yeah. the more as I've got older, the, the more yeah. under, undercover coppers I interview, I realise the depth that these people actually go oh, and yeah. the pain that they go, their minds are gone. Oh, yeah. The undercover paedophile, the little oh. undercover prostitute, I went on just to catch predators, <laughs> yep. people fucking try to abuse young kids. That And yeah. Um, yeah. Neil Woods, I know, another good guy, that j- he went undercover as a drug dealer. Yeah. Uh, and you can you see the twitches in their body the pain that they have to go yeah. through to the like, unbelievable work man you, people need to understand what the depths yeah. listen i always say this but there's good and bad everywhere you're going to get corrupt coppers you're going to, oh, any job any book, business i call it a two percent club yeah. it's two percent of bad in everything so if you imagine the met police two percent of the met police is is obviously huge if it was surrey police two percent would be a very small portion that's yeah. not exact but i call it the two percent club in the book about i've met you know, you meet idiots in all walks of life, whatever mm. you, whether you're a surveyor, you're a bank manager or whatever, there's always 2% of bad in, in, in every walk yeah. of life. Because the people who genuinely want to clean up the streets, that's unbelievable. Like yeah. to choose that job, you've kind of got to be, you probably not realise the extent no. you have to go through, kids getting raped, dead bodies, yep. Yep. fucking beatings all the time and yep. people hating on and you. And getting pers- and abused on yeah. walking the beat, getting the yeah. uh, where we used to get, the, you see police walking the beat, but the amount of abuse they get and also firefighters having bricks and throwing them out of blocks of flats. I mean, it's just paramedics getting abused. Yeah. It's awful. It sickens me it's when sad, I see yeah, that. These are hard working 
people yeah. who are doing a job to try and protect try us. Try to do the right yeah. thing because that's if the shit hits the fan, that's the first call. And they're the first to get, go, you know, yeah. they get reported yeah. on and it goes in the papers. But, you know, like I said, good and bad. But I think more now with podcasts and stuff, people can understand the depth that people go in. I've got so much respect for people who chooses that job. Like, yeah. I was doing dodgy shit anyway, so obviously yeah. you're going to go against the coppers because they're trying to put me in jail. Like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's but right. But now yeah. I understand how what my mind is. They yeah. were actually good people. Yeah. I was trying to do bad stuff. You you, know? you were, and you get older and yeah. wiser, don't we, James? Yeah, you yeah. Think, yeah. What an idiot. Yeah. But why was I raised like to think like fuck the police and you're thinking idiot, just an yeah. idiot. And now I understand the depth that they go through, and I think fucking mass respect for people who do that, yeah. man. We we you see them when they're young, you see they're sort of 18, 20. It's like all the stabbings, isn't yeah. it? What a waste of life. And mm. we've the sentences just aren't tough enough and they should be taken to the morgues to see their victims, to be honest with you. Because yeah. when you start seeing dead people, you you know, they got families. That's mm. their life ruined. That's yeah. their the the family can never never rest. Horrible. What's it like when you get called for a search and rescue and you don't find the body? Um we don't very often nowadays, I mean we often get we get called and we find. It's only when it gets left, like four five six days in the winter if there's a flood mm -hmm. and then like the body can get lodged under under a you know what they call strainers under logs and it gets held under with pressure if it's a really fast moving river to a bit of a strainers are it happens on tidal rivers as well but the strainers got to be there for it to get lodged under um yeah it's just i don't know do you feel defeated? Like yeah, I do, and I, I, I never give up on a lot of these. I mean, at the moment, I'm working on um, the Helen McCourt case, which is Helen went missing 30-odd years ago, and I'm, the mum come to me to try and help find mum. Um, a daughter, sorry, um, Marie McCourt come to me, and she brought in um, Helen's law. Helen went missing. She was murdered by um, scumbag. And he's he done thirty two years in jail, but he died. But he never would give up where the body was. So I've narrowed down looking at all the charts and you know all the maps we've got, the police information we've got to an area which I'm now doing a very very fine detailed search on. And I do that in my own time. I've, I I I normally fly out. I was due to go up this week actually, but the weather's not good for flying. It's a long drive for me. I'm busy, so I normally fly the helicopter up early morning, mm -hmm. land. Marie meets me there. She brings the sandwiches with her husband, John, and I spend the day in the woods looking. And now I've got Lucy Cybern helping me as well, the forensic archaeologist. And it's just, and it's like Nicola Payne. I search for them, and it's it's it's, and and that's one of the things I do want to talk about because the the Nicola Bully search. We all know about Nicola Bully, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of the search because there is. It'd be unprofessional me because there's an up, upcoming inquest, which is due on the 26th of June. But it was it, I wrote this book. It took me eight months to write this book of all the forensic work I've done and protester work I've done. And then we had the book launch on the Friday. The Daily Mail done two double-page features in the Saturday and Sunday Mail uh, two weeks earlier. And then we had the book launch with Alan Carr. Alan's a good friend of mine. We come; he, He's a neighbour. So we come in um, on, on Friday night in the Denby's Vineyard. And then Saturday, and I'd just done another big double-page feature with another national newspaper. I was due to go on radio, TV, breakfast the following week. And it was all lined up. And then suddenly on the Saturday after the book launch, the second, I got a call on the third to say, Peter, um, we need your help. Can you come and help us try and look? look for my wife you know so okay i've been watching it a bit on the news see where we are and then sky news because obviously they spoke to sky news sky news then can't start contacting me and asking me about what we can do so i gave a couple of interviews and um and then when i didn't find her it was interesting when when no bearing in mind the police were searching for three weeks doing a really thorough search I went up there for four days to do a no, three and a half days to do another thorough search using the sonar, and um, people accusing me of like trying to pl using this to plug my book. What they didn't realise is that on the Monday morning, as soon as we arrived, I rang the publisher and said, "Right, stop the TV interviews, stop the the big publication going out this week. We cannot promote this book while I'm while I'm working on this job. I, there is nothing. The book was never mentioned." because I got sideswiped by one of the reporters saying you're doing this for an ulterior motive and I really went for him and I wasn't wearing it 
and I'd, I was freezing cold. My team were, we we put our hearts into that, and it cost me thousands of pounds in wages, money, no mention of the book anywhere. And he was trying to get me to talk about the book, and I, I said, I'm not doing this for anyway. It's all. I put that on my Twitter feed just because I don't enough of it, and just on my Twitter feed alone, that went to six million views. Unbelievable! There was such a following of this, but unfortunately. Yeah, Nicola was eventually found in the reeds in the, in, in the edge of the river. But I'll I'll talk about that post inquest. But, but it's sad that you have to explain yourself that fuck them. But I had to, James, yeah, because, because you're yeah. clearly a good guy. You're out there yeah, fucking I'm, finding well, bodies well, they, and looking yeah. for serial yeah. killers, yeah. burying kids. That's like you're doing a fucking realize. good job. Like if, yeah. Even if you're promoting your book, yeah. Yeah. you fucking deserve to. I deserve you deserve it. to yeah, fucking but, make but a I bit of money. Not. No, I get yeah. it, but. You don't need to explain no. yourself to fucking assholes who no. don't realise the extent you go no. through seeing dead bodies every other day, searching for missing kids. No. But that's unbelievable what you're doing, Peter. That's Thank you. Yeah, phenomenal. No. Like, yeah. Massive respect towards but, you. Like, people don't realise the extent. But it's not just that one. Yeah. It was Ellis Downs when they couldn't find Ellis Downs laying in the river because Thames Valley got rid of their underwater search unit. We now do their diving. He couldn't be found. I come in and found him. Free of charge, we help the family. Nicola Payne. Marie McCourt helping her find in my own time delivering life jackets and I wasn't going to take this crap you know from people and it was just I was was not getting paid for any of the interviews I got offered money for two of the interviews I said well that money I want I don't need the money I'll give that to my life jacket campaign so that money has bought a load of life jackets and we've got it clear gone into the account for the life jacket campaign and it's in there and that's going to buy life jackets um, and I was sickened by these trolls and I don't normally get trolled and these vile individuals just online and, and I can see why I, I, I'm broad shouldered I, I don't care you know I really don't care but these idiots who are abusing me saying couldn't even find a you know, hooker in a brothel and stuff like that. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, I'm sure I could, yeah. but do you know what I mean? And it was yeah. just absolute sick. Anyway, that, it's right, kill it, block. But then you, you think, no, I'll unblock and let them see my work. Because if you read my book, you realize that I'm highly experienced in that job. And, you know, and one guy is really threatening. I said, do me a favor, come down and tell me to my face. And he just, he just went quiet. Mm -hmm. Come and tell me to my face and my team that we're a load of this. T come to my office. Here's our postcode. I look forward to seeing you. Welcome to social media. Though, yeah. That's why a lot of people actually take their own life because of trolls. Yeah. Because of the shit that people say. Listen, I'm so thick skinned with it all now. I just laugh it off and I'll fire back a couple of shots. It's childish, but this is the way the world. People are so lonely and so hurt that they're looking for people to hate on. People they yeah. don't even know. Yeah, but if you look at the people who are. are giving the abuse if you look at their profile all they're doing is abusing politicians all the time and people like that i mean you wouldn't want to be <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't want to be boris existence. johnson or rishi sunak if you're a pm you're getting that thousands of people doing it to you every day and yeah. it, it must be quite tough and you're trying to do your best best you can but you're just getting slammed how hard is it though when it's a high profile search and rescue and it's all over the new KUs, some yep. worldwide yep. like the pressure's on you to find a body. Like, do you feel that added pressure? Or is it just another yeah. job? No, I do feel the pressure. I, 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 I stay late, and I just, I just won't keep going until I find. Unfortunately, in the Nikki the Bully circumstance, I couldn't. I searched and searched and searched, and she, she wasn't there. You know, but not only me. It was the police had searched for three weeks and got over three weeks, and they couldn't find her either. You know, they had sonar, they had divers. The sonar won't go through the reeds, and that's what I want to make clear. So when you've got reeds at the side of the river, or weed, a sonar, that's not our remit. That's that's the bank search teams who search the banks to look down into the reeds. Um, and, and, you know, there was nothing on the bottom. And my team know me, I'll find a needle in a haystack. And it's there was we, we went back over the data every day and got nothing there. You know, so, but I won't talk about the general search because it's the wrong time to do it. But, yeah. yeah. But See the, the April Jones one as well? Like, how hard is that? April Jones was quite disturbing, actually. I mean, I got called in again. That was called in by the police um, on the database and to to assist. And I we didn't even charge them for that. I said to him, I can't charge you looking for a little girl. This is, like, sickening. And we flew up. I flew the helicopter up there. We used that. And we went up and searched the river. We got to, I've never, James, I've never seen so many people. There was thousands of public, 
There was thou there was mountain rescue, cave rescue, voluntary, lowland rescue everywhere. All it trying to get into McCunlith Town Hall in or into a sports centre to try and get briefings from the police. The police were struggling to brief everybody. So we just got on with our own search in the end. We were tasked with the river, we did that. But uh, he was another Bridger, Mark Bridger. He was another scum bag. He was just a vile, vile paedophile. And I spoke to the psychologist when I was there and said, these people, he said, Peter, they, they are waiting, they're wound up, and they just want to get their two minutes of sexual gratification, and then they kill them. And it's just, when you think about that, you just think, this poor kid, what she went through. And, and Bridger, you know, that's where... I'm very pro death penalty, you know. If it if they if you kill a child, you know, or if you 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 kill a child, you need to be disposed of as long as it's hundred percent proven. You know, there's no there's no way that you didn't you you did that. They just need wiping out. I mean, because again, Roy Whiting, he he was a convicted paedophile. He got released. Same old story. Got released on um, from his parole. Within two weeks, he went and murdered Sarah Payne. Sick bastards. I've had Sarah Sands on. Old man yeah. abused her sons. She killed him. She killed him. But well, the thing is, yeah. he abused kids, got bail, abused some more kids, got yeah. bail again. Yep. The sentences here are so lenient. Yeah. That yep. I've been talking about this quite frequently. Russia, death penalty. Yeah. Australia, take a passport, driving license, can't leave the country. UK, you can change your name for less than 20 quid. You get bail yeah. for sexual crimes on kids you get bail for hundred mil, uh, half a million images on a computer and the guy get community service that you it's clear that these people are fucked up in the head the only yeah. way to deal yeah. with them yeah. is put them on an island themselves like yeah. you say Great. death penalty you, you kill a kid you've got to die even yep. raping a kid yep oh yeah that's yep. that kid is scarred for life yep. that's, that's a right. death penalty for them but yet you can roam the streets for after 12 months in prison yeah. yep. it's not right man like you speak out about this shit and people say, oh, but you get people, it's not been, it's uh, well, wrong convictions. We get yeah. it, but like you say, 100% proof, like, there's not, there's obviously yeah. going to be evidence there. There's people get wrongly convicted, we get it, but when it comes to kids and rape, the DNA is there. Yeah. But probably 97% of the British public would like that. They would like that sentence. It's like if you stab somebody and murder them in cold blood. At the moment, you know these people. Some are getting like six years. Not the police. It's the it's the it's the judges giving them that time. Some judges will go, "You're not coming out." But I mean, like, look at Lee Rigby and things like that. Terrorism stuff. We we shoot the terrorist in London, and straight away the police are giving him first aid. You know, it's just just shocking. Yeah, absolutely shocking. How so? The amount of people go missing every year. Yeah. Why is it when it's a certain one that it hits world headlines? Like, who picks and chooses? Who gets the, the media attention? I don't know. I really don't know, James. I'm, I think she was a pretty 40-ish blonde lady, probably, and it, it, it stayed in the media, didn't it? There was Once you get Sky News and everybody up there, she still wasn't found. We turned up because it was starting to wane off the search, I think, and then we turned up, and then obviously everyone's up there again and then everyone's starting to get excited that we're going to find her unfortunately we didn't and uh you know that's i just wish we could have done i wish she was alive i wish we were all wrong and wish she was just walked off somewhere and had an affair or whatever you know got run off run off somewhere but unfortunately she didn't that was she couldn't have you ever had that you've went to search for somebody and they've actually just been away partying or away just doing their thing <laughs> No, we haven't. I worked. I'd, I'd done a bit of work on the Corey Corey McKee case. McKee case, the missing airman. Um, that was an that was that was an interesting case. That one, we disappeared off the face of the earth. But I think um, no, mainly they're they're deceased when we're when we're looking. Generally, you know, that's the problem. Once we get called, once that person in water generally generally sometimes we're lucky we get stood down and we get a call from fire and rescue call us out sorry fire and rescue call us out and say we've got a person in water and then we're halfway there in the trucks and then we get the pager going off stand down and they've just been recovered by firefighters or lowland rescue in the water which lucky enough mm -hmm. yeah see like madeline mccann case and stuff look like, what do you think of this case that was an odd one that was a really odd one i don't know i mean I think the whole
policing side over there they missed a lot obviously the portuguese police probably missed a lot i was i I had a couple of news news channels contact me and said can you go we pay you to go over there and do some so i just said no i don't want to i'm not interested in that it's It's rocking the boat in it as well because it's so yes there's i think there are a couple odd balls personally but yeah there's something not right about it how they can be i've interviewed people who have lost kids right 10 years ago five years ago and they're fucking still distraught yeah, they look yeah. dead themselves because yep. of the yep. pain in their face. Oh, yeah, they will. And I, I try and give him the benefit of the doubt by being a doctor and maybe he's seen dead bodies, maybe he's immune to it. Like yourself, seeing bodies all the time, you like, but that's yeah. your kid. That's, that's your, your fucking kid. That's your child. Something looks the way they were playing tennis two or three days later, and I think that just ain't sat right for me. And I don't yeah. have the answers because I don't imagine know. they were innocent. Imagine somebody oh, did, yeah. did yeah. come and kidnap the kid. I personally don't think. That's happened. I believe the kid died in the flat with the information that I have. Yep, maybe being yep. drugged or whatever. But again, it's you can't really. I've got so much opinions and certain things, but I could yeah. be wrong. But if I'm wrong and I'm spreading false information as well, well do you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to be careful. Yeah, like yeah. Well, anything I say now, everything is as soon as I'm in the bully case. Every the, the YouTubers and tick. I'm on. <laughs> every, my name is on Twitter, TikTok every day, yeah. and they're hashtag Peter Folding. And I'm going, leave me alone. But they're just saying that and there's all these armchair detectors. A lot of them have got some really good information. To be fair, a lot of them are coming up some interesting theories. And when you look at it, but I, I, I just keep out of it. I mean, I've got to yeah. I've got to stay clear until after the inquest. But the way now everything's a conspiracy theory and everything's sex if you think, oh wait a minute, that's there's more involved or it's satanic yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah, this and it's that. I, I, and people I, it's yeah. in, it's intriguing. People throw their own spin at it. But yep. sometimes it's just listen the suicide or it was whatever. Yeah. Like, see when, see, see when you go through all that though, and you're in. What's the one case? Because it, obviously, if you're doing them all the time, I'd imagine it becomes a norm. But what's the one case that sticks in your mind, and you think you still get haunted by it? I think they all. You remember them all. Mm-hmm. I think there's no no particular one that that haunts me i think tobin was always just i i never saw the victims but that's just quite a when you realize that he was he there's so many other victims out there maybe but i think they're they're all bad i think the drownings still are the ones that probably haunt me more than anything i had an interesting one in a garden in in um boreham wood and again mark mark called me said pete i've got a job for you and he said, I'm going to send you some info, you know, really confidential information now. It's all out. It's gone to court now. And we've got a, a, a guy who's gone missing. He's 70, he was um, about 90 years old. Son's suspicion of murder. We're going to nick him. And we're going to go and arrest him. We want you to do a full forensic search of the house, the loft, everything. And we're looking for a body. I said, okay. So two weeks later, we geared up. Police went in, arrested the son on suspicion of murder. I got on the radar. Anyway, I've, I've I've quickly run the radar over the patio while the team are setting up. Nothing under there, nothing under there. And I thought, where am I going to start? You always start place what's least overlooked from the neighbour because the neighbour was the nosy neighbour who said, I believe that he's buried him in the garden. And when it was reported to the police initially, they said, no, he's gone to Poland. And they went to the CID and then eventually she complained so much that actually the the um, the serious crime directorate got involved and started looking into bank accounts, the money, and and so the son was paying hookers to come in on Friday nights with his dad's doll money. Dad had disappeared, and she said, "I'm sure he's buried in the garden." So anyway, started using the radar, looking around. I found and straight away I found that it looked like a buried a coffin. So got forensic archaeologist Carl Carl Harrison, Dr. Carl Harrison, his team. They dug it up. They started dig, 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 and there's a huge box buried. I'm thinking the guy is either a midget because the box was only so big, or he's been dismembered, or he's been completely folded in half. And I'm thinking, crikey, I've only been here ten minutes, and I found him. Good, good job. So then Carl started opening the box, and inside there was this dog wrapped in plastic with a little rose on it, and he perfectly buried the dog. Now that could have been a decoy because I was gone about decoys. So you lift you lift the box out to make sure dad's not been buried under the box because most people go, oh, it's only a buried dog, fill it back in again. Ah, always check everything. So then I then started looking at other parts of the garden and there was three beehives over to one side. No bees in it, lucky enough. That was the wrong time of year. So take the beehives out of the way. 
and underneath I run the radar over and could be getting a big signal to get my trowel out which I carry and I start scraping away three buried handguns and um, 200 rounds of ammunition and most people go oh he's a terrorist no dad was an ex-Polish soldier so it's easy to jump to conclusions and then in the garage when we camped there I found two pineapple hand grenades which had been deactivated anyway whilst I'm digging these digging these um, gr this stuff up to give to the police someone shout grenades evacuate and i'm going it's all right they're, i've checked them early i'm ex military they're dummies they're they're, they're deactivate evacuate and i said i can tell you now they're deactivated evacuate so everyone's all outside in the road they've put cordons around they've called the eod in from didcot the Ar army bomb disposal boys turn up sergeants walked in i said hi sergeants i said do you want a coffee i said they i've checked them earlier he, he walked straight over and he said, yeah, you're right. Anyway, that was that. Just got back to work again. The, the other stuff got taken away up in the thing. Someone shouted from the top bedroom, grenades, evacuate. I go, not again. Exactly. The, now, bearing in mind, the, the, the team had already dr started driving back to Didcot. Next minute, you go, dee -da, dee -da. they turn up the unmarked white truck, get out, come straight in the bedroom, two more dummy grenades you know he was a sex soldier he was just connecting them as uh, mementos you know so anyway we we cracked on there got four days the sio said i want the patio dug up i said he's not under the patio i want it dug up i said that's going to take us about four days a big job i want it dug up okay we'll dig it up so everyone's police us can go hammers rip the pat nothing there he said right that's it he's not here i want everyone wrapped up and leave the scene i said well I'm not going to go until I'm not going to put my name to this job until I've searched every inch of this garden. I've got all this bit to do behind the greenhouse. He said, well, I'm off for the weekend. I'm doing a dance. And yeah, funny looks from the police officers going, okay, governor. So he, he drove off and then I got the radar and we moved this barrel and then went over the rear path. I got a big read and I said to Chris, oh, that looks good. Now give me the magnetometer. So I went the magnetometer over there. I said, I think we might have found it. Anyway, uh, we lift the slabs up, got the archaeologist, dig down, and dig down, and it's actually in the book. It's actually at the grave, um, it's actually in the book. Um, incredible. Anyway, I found him, and it, that's a great feeling um, when, you, when you actually do that, and uh, that's looking down into the grave. That's me looking down into the grave. I can't pronounce his name. He was a Polish gentleman, and... Um, so you just got to be determined, you know. So what's that feeling then when you when you find someone? It's it. Well, it's just. Is that a sense of relief? Or is that a sense of job done? Yeah, it's a sense of relief, and you. Well, the the rest of your family want to know where you know potentially dad is. I mean, he was 90, 90 years old, and you you you. I always I go into so much detail. I ask so many questions of people because I I'm always suspicious of everyone. And when I do these jobs, I don't trust anybody. I'm sort of, and and I I keep asking lots of questions. I was I was f confident that he was there, and obviously the SIO went away, and uh, they had to ring him. He was halfway down the M M M40, whatever, and uh, he had to come back up again. You've clearly got a gift for something. It's like a yeah, I wouldn't maybe a calling, but you've got a, like a it's like a feeling. Yeah, something's not right here. Like yeah, do you feel like a sort of gift where you're thinking? where yeah. you can work on your feelings instead of yeah. actually using equipment do you feel that yeah i do no i do and that's what i'm doing with marie mccourt uh, helen mccourt murder because sims is dead now he will never give up where she was but i can't use equipment in the woods i can't use ground radar because firstly it's 30 odd years ago and marie um the technology is lots of tree roots in the way but where i live on the farm i've got alpacas and when they die naturally i may say that when they die i bury them with the jcb and i teach forensic students about grave depressions so i've got a keen eye for finding graves so one of the one of the other ones which talk about in the book it's in the prologue actually is is um kate prout so julia marogna she was the um senior investigating officer i was in london i got a call and uh pete I've got a job for you, urgent. And I've said, what is it? And she, I've got a miss per. We've ballsed the search up. She said she was absolutely effing and blinding at me down the phone. And Julia's brilliant. I've worked with her on so many cases because she used to be on the data, national database. 
and said, I need you down here like now. I said, I'm in London. I can't. In the morning. Okay. So I flew the helicopter down there, landed in the field. She come and <clears throat> greeted me, quick selfie. She wanted by the helicopter, walked into the wood. I said, right, what have we got? So said, um, d- husband has admitted to the murder. He said, we got five pheasant pens. He said he buried her in the pheasant, in front of the pheasant pen. Okay. Where's the pheasant pens? He said, they've been ripped up. Who ripped them? Who dug them up? They've been dismantled. Who'd, who done that? the team on site and the archaeologists i said why are they digging over there and they were literally digging this whole area up i said right all stop i need time so the sio goes everybody stop work that's it and he got rid of everyone for the night everyone shut the site down it was guarded by um, a scene guard and i said look we've got to go back to the beginning here right pheasant pens where are they so we walked over to the where the old pheasant pens were now bearing in mind they had ground radar they had archaeologists who said there's no disturbed ground and i said well let's get the pheasant pens because he said when he buried her he he put his jacket on the pheasant pen like this they're like corrugated iron four posts corrugated steel and he hung his jacket and he put his torch up there so he could see what he's doing on a big farm that's where he buried her so we put the pheasant pens back together, found the holes, put them back exactly where they were, not just the four posts, not the tin, just the four posts, and we put them all in a line. I said, right, what we got to do is draw a semicircle round in front of each one. She'll be there. But the archaeologist said they've searched it. I said, well, sorry, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm telling you. Anyway, so I said, Chris, get the metal detector. And I had to go back. I had to go back because I had another urgent job to look at. And I said, Chris, get the metal detector and I want you to go over this area with our powerful metal detector. She's buried in a watch, apparently. She's still got a, a watch on and we may even pick her up. But w- the thing is, it was just like a sand material. So, you know, it's like when you dig a sandcastle for your kids on the beach. You've got a sandcastle, you've got a hole. And as the side tide washes back in, that sand just all joins back together again. It's like no hole's been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, clay, I've seen that on yeah, the audio book. Yeah, clay is totally different. Oh. Clay will just be lumps of clay and you get sticks buried and everything else. So anyway, I got a phone call from Chris. He said, we've got her the following morning. And the archaeologist dug her up and that's where she was. And we got a reading from her watch and she still had her watch on her. And it's just having that ability to go in, take control of everything, and then actually start asking questions. Because I've done so many of these you know, I've done one in Ealing where the Met were searching for a body under a floor and I wasn't very popular with them for some reason. I never met the person. I wasn't not going to name her, but didn't want me there. And I, I, and the SO said, I've asked Peter to come in and search. That's what I want done. We're looking for a body. So we do- checked the back garden, found a buried hammer and a crowbar. And I said, then I need to get under the bedroom floor. I need to search this. We've done it. And I said, well, I need to do it. She said, we don't need SGI or Peter Fold in here, thank you very much. You can go. We've searched it three times. I said, well, I need that signed off. Anyway, months later, it went to court, and the guy stole the man's identity. I think it was a Brazilian guy. It's in the book. can't remember the, his exact name now. He buried the body under the floor, in the soil, under the floorboards, and the police missed it. I would have gone under the radar and I would have found him straight away. Probably wouldn't have even needed the radar, to be honest with you, because I know the way the ground settles. This is what I study in my farm. I've got all that. I, 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 that's what I do. Is there not a smell after the dead body? No, <coughs> was no it was well myth? wrapped up. The body was well wrapped that up. Is that Yeah, it was all wrapped up. You see problems and they come in and hold oh, yeah. when they see no, bodies. No. Is- there is, if it's uncovered, but it was wrapped up. And it was completely wrapped in, I think, plastic. But it was covered with soil, so the soil will contain the smell. So it's different, you know, but it's like the MI6 spy in the bag. That was another one. Mm-hmm. Where's the worst place somebody's trying to hide a body? Where's the worst place trying to hide a body? Um, I think I think the, the, the one in Boreham Wood was a good one. That was a clever one, under the path. No one would... And we got to think the dogs were there all week. The, people assume that a dog will pick a body up. The dog will pick a body up if it's got the scent of the body. If it hasn't got the scent, so in other words, that's why the police probe the ground with a probe to release the scent to come to the surface. So if I hadn't have gone in with a radar, he would never have been found. 
he would never have been found and 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 that that's the thing with all this you've got to you've just got to be determined what makes a good sex and sex what <laughs> makes a good search and rescue person like what's the what's the ingredients you need i think it's determination really and and you've just got to be you you've just got to go with your gut instinct sometimes you can have all the technology in the world but technology doesn't the technology we've got is really good kit i'm happy with what we've got but you've just got to be able to put the jigsaw puzzle together make lots of notes i mean i i i, I take a little notepad with me on on thing and i i always talk to the families because you might end up with a family being one of the suspects so you take your make making notes in your background you walk off and you go mm, that's an interesting thing he you know he or she said there that doesn't quite stack up to me have you ever felt that when somebody's trying to throw you off and you, maybe like the son or the daughter has concerned oh. all the tears and it's fucking them, it's buried the body. Oh, yeah, we were on the Mahmoud Basood case. Um, Carol, DCI Caroline Good, she was old school cop. She was brilliant. And we went in, we went into the, um, I was searching, it not far from here, actually, uh, near Vauxhall, there was a, the, the, the girl had been uh, raped by the family, the members, and they murdered her because she was seeing a white guy or whatever. And um, it was called an honour killing, a so-called honour. It was horrendous. So we searched an old Undertaker's. And I remember being on the Undertaker's and in the back garden, there was a, a big copper cart skit laying up on a trestle, all rusting away. I said, just as a question, anyone looked in that cart skit? <laughs> just make sure she's not in there. Anyway, we'd done the radar. We'd done diving on it. We'd done all sorts. I remember, And they were giving us abuse. We were down the river and the family were just swearing and being vile towards us. They really were a vile family, and and they all got convicted and jailed. But the trouble is, they'd probably be out in them two or three years now. They come out and they'd be released into the into the public again. That honour killing stuff is mad. Especially yeah, it's mad here in the UK. I think they were setting someone on fire in Birmingham. I had a woman on a couple of weeks ago, Horrible. Nina, abused by her father, abused by her husband, abused yep. by her, her father-in-law. Yep. And because she wasn't accepting it, they would yep. try to kill her, try to kill her yep. sister. Yep. I think the father took the six-year-old daughter away because. I don't, and she she went missing, but yeah. the police don't do anything no, for the honor they're... killings, especially over there. Anyway, maybe yeah. in the if it happens in the UK, but mm. the sentences are lenient for that as well. Here, yeah, they are. Yeah, why? It's still murder. Know. Yeah, it's murder. I mean, we we've got to get a grip of our sentencing over here because it would probably. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that, but reduce. If you said like if you said to a guy who stabs someone, you stab somebody, you're going to get if they if they die, you're going to get life. If you if you stab someone, you likely get ten years in jail. It would focus your mind because yeah. you imagine you said you were a young Herbert, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you 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 think if someone said to you, you stab this guy, not that you would stab anyone, but it's like you, you beat the crap out of this guy, and this guy um, dies of head injuries or something like that, yeah. you're going to get twenty five years. You'd think, whoa, hang on a minute, do I actually hit that bloke? Well, Glasgow was the mother capital of Europe yeah. for a, for a while, but they brought the laws out with knife crime, five years, bang. And it's kind of everything. Did they down. really? I didn't know. Yeah, that. they changed the laws. Well, they, years well, that's what, a blade. well, that's what we need in yeah. here. That's what we need. We need to get a grip here because it's it's just people getting away with it. It was a knife crimes in Glasgow. That's what, and it was a murder capital of Europe for a yeah, few yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Five years of carrying a blade, bang, changed. Now it's Glasgow's a pretty safe place, I think, man. I think national service, because as you know in the book, I speak about my time in the reserve parachute regiment, and that was that was great a great grounding for me. How do you deal with it all now, Peter? Just everything you've seen and went through that, because it's uh, with the people I interview as well. I question life a lot, hell, a lot more because I know the dark shit that happens. That like, you've worked in it, both you've seen it. I only hear the stories. Maybe affect me, and and in time, I don't know. But hearing all the dark stuff, but you've seen it. So, how do you kind of balance the lifestyle with sitting in the garden with the kids to be then going digging up young girls and boys? <laughs> I'd, <clears throat> I mean, most of our work now is, like I said, it's people missing in water as well. That's that. That's the that's the volume. We, mm -hmm. like I said, every year there's a convey about a death going on, and it's it's horrible. I I just have to switch off. I've got a really good family behind me, and I live on a farm. My mum's in a cottage, and I've got a loving family. And um, we'll, you know, I go on holiday. I have nice holidays. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's why way of escapism you know we 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 fly off to the caribbean or whatever or next week i've i've got a trike and i'm i'm actually working on another book at the moment good on you mm. man so i'm actually what? i last year I, I i got a harley harley davidson good trike on, yeah. fucking caribbean so harley, I, man. no i did <laughs> living the high life but oh, i did i went to um i went to italy last year for 3 weeks now i my wife is my ma- my wife's mum's got dementia unfortunately so thank you uh, james and uh, i couldn't get to canada because i hadn't been vaccinated i never got vaccinated I, well, yeah, I, I, i've got I, I ain't gonna get that and i cut you can from the 11th but i couldn't get the states anyway she said why don't you because i was working on the book at the time why don't you just take your bike off for three weeks while we're away me and summer and drive around europe and work on your book i said you know what that'd be great so i got i got me harley I loaded it all up. I was going to go camping. I thought, you know what? No, I'll stay in hotels. I can afford to, so I'll do that. I drove down through the wine regions, and then I hit the Alps, and I went through three days of snow. It was horrendous. And all these French people going by me going, this guy's on a trike in the snow. He must be mad. And I did. And then I went down to Saint-Tropez, Monaco, and I worked on the book. And I got so much work done on it. And that's what I'm doing next week. I'm going to go out to... Italy again take my wife out uh, but we're going to do the lakes for I'm driving across to pick her up at Milan and then we're going to do the lakes for mm. four days and then I'll come back over Switzerland it uh, gives me time just to write fair play you, mate. you know got... what you deserve it as Thank well you. Peter mate Thanks, so you yeah. seem to have found the balance in life mm. like I say you're not dead behind the eyes we're seeing all that dark no. shit and, you, no. and that affects you maybe yeah. you're just solid think, enough where you just think fuck it go on with it because that's all you can do in life as well that yeah who's, who's really there do you know what i mean what can you really do if you're struggling with it all you can do is just listen get on with it but i do think though if you haven't got a good family behind you that's when if i was a lonely if i was living on my own and i went home to an empty house at night and that's the people i sort of feel sorry for who've got like you know when someone's been with a partner all them years and they've mm-hmm. now left on their own that would be tough I wouldn't enjoy that. I see it in the undercover guys and yeah. girls. A yeah. lot of you see them being divorced two, three times, oh, kind yeah. of turn to drink. Yep. Um, yep. And it's sad because of the dark shit that they see. Yeah. For anybody that's watching, Peter, that's maybe likes to go out and paddle boards and jet skis, like, what advice would you have for them? I would say anyone, if you go near water, wear a life jacket. Don't think if if you think you go skiing, we'll ski. We wear a helmet now. We wear a seatbelt in a car. We wear a cycle helmet on a push bike. And it's just, you cannot, you will not swim in the sea for long. If if no matter how good a swimmer you are, if the sea gets choppy or you fall off your paddleboard or or your or your boat sinks or whatever, you're gonna die. You're gonna drown. And 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 that's fact. And if you've got kids, don't let them jump off of bridges into what we're all we've all done stupid things, but it's all about showing off and Every year we recover so many people from the water. I say on average 10 every year, 2016, 16 and eight weeks. And it's only when you see this. So what I'm doing at the moment, I'm working on a water safety video <clears throat> and I want to get that out free. It's not a commercial venture. It's just so it can be put out on TikTok and all the channels. And that's not my field, but it can be shared and shared and shared and people can either listen or they know but it's the adults when i deliver the life jackets to the schools i say to the kids that how hands up whose mummy and daddy's got paddle boards and they go like this i only even got life jackets one or two hands go up because they just buy these things and and no one advises them and they just paddle out and there's so many deaths on them you know don't not do it but just buy a they're 30 quid Pass safety. It's just not worth it. Like mm-hmm. if you went in Loch Lomond, put your kids in a life jacket, put yourself, because it's not cool not to wear one. People think, oh, I don't want to, I'm well hard. I don't want to sort of go out there without a life jacket, but we're the people. And one quick one, uh, you know, we, 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 I was with a little lad a couple of years ago and um, we got called to an incident late at night and his dad fell over the side of a boat and he was left in the middle of the river, they're fishing, floating until he got rescued. He was in the boat and I said, I need to speak to the son had gone. He got taken home that night. It was 11, 12 o'clock at night. And we, we said, look, we're going to have to come back in the morning. I need to get some, a witness here because we, we could end up getting either down river or up river. We don't know where we're searching. And I went over with a police officer, spoke to the little lad, said, tell me where daddy fell in the river. And he, and I said, I know it's difficult. And he came over and he said, he fell in there. <clears throat> so I went and got the team. We got the sonar together and I knew straight away I'm going to find him. And I towed the sonar up, first sweep, there he is, put the shot line in. And uh, 
I've got a beautiful sonar image of him on the bottom. So we put the line down so that my diver can then go down. And <clears throat> then I had to go and tell the family. And I thought it's only right that I go and talk to the family. So I went over and I remember speaking to mum and the wife, his mum and wife. And I went over to him. So I've got some, fortunately I've got some bad news that we've located him. And two of these mum and daughter and the wife, sorry, just collapsed literally in front of me and all the friends grabbed him i was with a police officer and i just had to do a u-turn tears running down my eyes and i just walked up and it's just so difficult and it's just it's only when you see these people and you see these people drowned and they're staring at you and that's why i'm so passionate about water safety and i know i drone on about it sometimes but it's only when you actually see them mm. that you've got to do yeah. something so you've somebody buddies a body that after 10, 15 years, like how low would it go? How, how, what in depth? Or could it start with like the, the roots and stuff? Like how? Yeah. The body, body won't go any deeper, but there was one interesting one on the Moors murderer that I didn't work on, but that was Dr. Professor John Hunter. And the, apparently the peat bog moves so the body can sort of go deeper and deeper and deeper. In clay, they don't go anywhere. They'll, they'll decompose and there'll be skeleton, a skeleton eventually found unless they've been wrapped in plastic. And if they've been wrapped in plastic and the air can't get to them, then they, they're in sort of, they, they tend to be found better. What's the worst state of a body you found? I might fish the guy out. We did, my team, and I was on the boat actually. So we'd been looking for him for a while but it was in flooded river. And then one day it was, he, he was, he got lodged somewhere and then we found a canoeist was going by and there was a pair of feet hanging out the water. <clears throat> so we got there and we, it was really quite a fast current. So we, we had to anchor the, moor the boats up with lines, put the diver over in quite a heavy current and he recovered and we put Vic on our nose so we can't smell. And this guy was just, it was he. He was twice the normal size of himself. He was just bloated like a, a bloated seal, and it was just horrendous. His face was all eaten. It was just like, and you're just trying to not breathe through your nose. You're trying to you're trying to hold your nose without de holding it, but you've got that. And then the divers in the water actually got his arm around him, and then of course diver has to come out. That's tough for the diver. Then the divers all hosed down with disinfectant and the fire brigade were with us as well, you know, firefighters. It's tough that's it's a tough fucking job, aren't it? Is. Oh, it is. Fair play to you, nothing Thank but you. respect for you, Peter, genuinely. Like, Thank you, James. Do you ever when you're walking the streets like get a like now we get smell sometimes and it takes us back yeah. to a place. Do you ever get that? It's not as if there are dead bodies out there, but do you ever no. get a smell where it takes you back and it kind of throws that, your day off? That doesn't, but I obviously live in the country and if I walk through the woods and I, I will smell death straight away of a decomposing animal. And I will pick it up and I'll go and check that it's not a human being. <laughs> it's a bit weird because you sort of, you just smell it. I walk down a footpath, I go, hang on a minute. I'll say, just a minute, because I, I run a bit, you know, and I, I go, something's not right here. And I go and have a poke around in the bushes and I'll, I'll, I'll follow my nose to the scent and there'll be a dead dead rabbit or a dead fox it's just it's just the way it is you just gifted peter you're gifted for that mm -hmm. do you think running kind of not saves you but you kind of keeps you sane i think yeah i walk every day with my dogs i do about three probably three what miles dogs you got i've got a german shepherd i've got a malamute cross german shepherd Mad bastard, same. portuguese water Mad. dog and my mum's got a little Yorkshire terrorist. Yeah, I've got so, a Rottweiler. Yeah, oh wow. He's a fucking. So they're case. great. They're great. My dogs are the, the dogs are like they're your best friends, aren't yeah, they? I love them. I think I mean, I've got American bullies and that as well. My sister, that oh, well. I love dogs. That's what I'm all about. That's where I find my peace. Just being with my dogs. Yeah, get kids and messies and dogs family, are, but yeah. the dogs is where I feel my happy. <laughs> I, 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 well, it was one sad the other week. We I'll be quick, but we we, we done a, a really sad job the other That's week. Okay. There was a lady who got eaten. Well mauled by dogs in Catrum in Surrey and it was all over the news and she was um, attacked by she was out and there were some horses there was a bit of an altercation and she got chased by one one of those seven dogs she was a dog walker they're not her dogs but she had seven dogs and one turned on her and, and a thing and the police obviously had to take all the dogs into custody and I had to go and recover the evidence. And we, she was down a really steep bank, so the fire brigade couldn't recover. I thought we were going to a hanging. 
and um, we had to go and recover the body of the lady, unfortunately. And then I had to find the evidence because we had a missing missing bits and pieces to find. Um, so that was particularly horrible. But also I felt so much for the dogs because if the dogs get destroyed, it's proving which dog done it. And there was seven little dogs, seven dogs who belonged to somebody. And that's tough. What sort of dogs? That one was a big bull mastiff, I think, but that's the right. others were other types of dogs. And I just thought, how are we going to prove? Because I'd done the I got the DNA on the dogs. Well, the well, they did the the scenes of crimes were really good. They'd done the DNA swabs of the of the of the wounds. They'd done that of the dogs, and they'd done DNA tests of the dog. But it was a pretty harrowing job, to be honest. Eaten to death by the dog. Not eaten, but badly bitten. Yeah, yeah. Neck. Yeah. Badly bitten, yeah. Only one dog had done it? Not sure, not sure. But it was down a very, very steep bank, so it was a very difficult one to get to. Get to. I was speaking to a man who yeah. trains dogs, he used to train yeah. dogs for the police. Yeah. He says if your dog loves you, but he says if you die, your dog can eat you. Yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe. Yeah. Or if he's hungry. Yeah. But yeah, the dogs The dogs will always like, often stay with their owner. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the lad in the river that day, Dogs are amazing. He was amazing. And he was just literally crying by the river. And he Sad pinpointed that. it exactly for us. And I said, put the diver in exactly here. Seen He's probably there. Seen the Met Coppers shot two dogs, man. Like for me, it's disgusting. I don't know the full ins and outs of the story, but the no. kid's standing with two dogs, like, and he's yeah. shouting. They're shouting. Like, you're shouting. You're going to upset the dog straight away. Anyway, saw, what can you do in that situation? I saw that yesterday. I was quite, I was, I was quite shocking, actually, the amount of people there. And I, I, I said, I don't know the circumstances, so it'd be easier to criticise from a distance. But I think, I think all the shouting, the shouting and the screaming doesn't help anybody it's mm -hmm. like trying to be calm it's like with us uh, we do our job we we go in we're just calm and do our job we're not shouting around we just get on with the job leave go in leave quietly mm -hmm. it's a very difficult one yeah how do you feel telling your story today peter oh james it's been it's it's different because you you do the odd media interview and you know what it's like there's nothing against the media they cut the piece they want so you might only get two minutes of your story and yeah. i think all the people who doubted me recently on my experience and all i'd say is if you doubt me and my experience read the book listen to the audio book um and if you it, it's it's got some great reviews and it's doing well i mean because it, it does take you right in it talks about protest and it talks about Mm -hmm. And then goes into the crime stuff. Yeah, it's a bit more of my life, but it's 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 been really great to come on and. That's an unbelievable, Peter. Rest, massive respect for you, mate. Like mm. the books, I'm only a quarter way through the audio book. Like it's unbelievable what you're doing. You should be proud. Your father would be proud, no yeah, doubt. My dad, man, my dad would. My dad passed away in 2013, and that. that. Thank you, James. And that's if Dad could see what we've achieved now. I think that would be. We are the like real Thunderbirds, you know. So it's yeah. quite quite an interesting thing. And last week we had the Lord Lieutenant come down of Surrey, mm -hmm. which is quite that's the King's representative for Surrey come down to see us, which is pretty cool actually. Quite yeah. quite quite special. And your dad, like like I My say, dad. taking you under his wing and showing you a life that we kids should be is just a wee bit of element of danger, but a lot a lot of a love and fun. And I say, yeah, if if people are listening, get your kids outside. Don't take the iPads away. Take the phones away because it, it, I I get in at night and I throw my phone on the side. I don't sit and look at social media. I post for social media about our work, but I don't go. Oh, I've got ten likes. I'm not interested. I don't care who likes my posts, and I don't get time to reply. People leave nice comments, but I haven't got time to start going through all this mm -hmm. stuff. It's just I'm busy with a company. I've got 54 staff. I've got a lot of staff yeah. work for me, so it's a busy time, you know? Hopefully nobody ever has to, but if anybody that maybe needs your help, Peter, how do they get involved? If they need our help and there's they got a missing loved one and the police can't find them or whatever, just call the, the office on, you know, 01306 889969. We're manned 24-7, the control room. If you look at our Facebook, Specialist Group International, my Facebook, Peter Folding, um, and it's really, it's ring up because... We might not, you know, I haven't got time to go start going through social media messages and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, it's, it's, it, we, I'm helping a couple of families in Scotland at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, the lady's, um, advice over the phone, the lady's mum went in the river, another one missing up on a lock. Mm -hmm. So just giving them phone advice. Yeah, it's mad because I watched a documentary, Spencer Matthew, the boy's name is Made in Chelsea's in reality, kind oh, of right, star, yeah. but his brother done, um, 
not Ben Nevis, the what's the tallest mountain in the world? Oh, Everest. Everest, Mount Everest, and his brother passed away there 15 years ago, fell, but oh, they my. took a rescue team out. They never found them, but they found other bodies and they took the bodies to the families because even though they die, it's not a case of people rescuing the bodies because it no. costs so much it does. to go there and find the bodies. It's not a case of, of bringing the bodies back to the family. So they couldn't find the brother, but they done an amazing thing and took the body oh, wow. back to one of the brothers in, I think it was maybe like Tibet or whatever. That's and pretty it was, special. Such a, so it was quite a hard-hitting documentary, powerful man. I'll have like, to watch that. Yeah, you like it. So yeah. it's mad that bodies can be left there for 10 20 30 years and they were going yeah. by the jacket but the coloring would have wore off yeah yeah and sure the, but they were going for the with the make of the boot yeah which was in the 90s or something and yeah. they never ever found them because obviously the snow the mountains yeah. and the temperature and but it's fascinating stuff what you people do man it's like yeah. unbelievable that people it's good that people can get an understanding of the shit that you have to go through yeah the abuse that you have to take and you're out there trying your yeah. hardest to try and give peace and to some families and some kind of closure, whether yeah. it's a kid who died 20 years ago, and that's the mad thing, that like you're giving closure to people who can kind of, they'll never ever move on, but it gives them some sort of mm. peace that, yeah. okay, I've, I've got my, my son or my daughter back. Yeah, absolutely, Joan. No, it's, we do the best we can. But I know I got, a, I must say, I've got a great team around me um, who I work with, so they're, they're there, they're on call 24-7. And we and we're there. We never know when we're going to get called. Yeah, fair play. Yeah, would you like to finish up on anything, Peter? I'd just like to say, keep up the good work. What you're doing, but no, thanks for just a a nice relaxing chat. Yeah, you know, it's good to be able to just talk normally and have a, and have a laugh, you know, yeah. as well. Because whenever I talk, I'm always the Grim Reaper, you know, because <laughs> it's all about yeah. it's all about you know dying and every yeah, people yeah. dragging people out of rivers which is obviously you know there's a lot of gallows humor mm -hmm. goes on because you have to if not you 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 just crack up yeah and where can people buy your book then buy it on um waterstones all good bookshops you can mm -hmm. get it ordered and also it's available on audible it's eight hours and 15 minutes on audible it's read by simon darwin who's the narrator i couldn't narrate it he's i've got, he's got the gift he's an actor so he mm -hmm. narrated it and it's on, um, Am it's on, say, Amazon anyway, on Audible, Amazon, Kindle. It's all there. And, um, yeah, hopefully you enjoy yeah. it. I'll leave the link in the description. Peter, listen, phenomenal Thanks what lot, you're Joe. doing. No, I'm proud you. of you. No, thank I you very much. The best for the future. Yeah. Cheers, James. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Take yes. care. Cheers, James.